time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. We're not old after all. That's right. We're still we still got pep in our voice. That's <laughs> right. Pep in our voice. Pep in the voice. All right, you ready? All right. All right, guys, we're back with another episode of Table Talk. Today, my guest is Dr. Mike. Really doesn't need any introduction, but I'm still going to say co-founder of RP Strength, co-founder of Team ROM, right? Team Full ROM. Team Full yeah. ROM. Yeah, but like, you know, that's just a little side project with my, with my homies. Yeah. Um, uh, it is a subsidiary of RP Strength. Yes. And you have two YouTube channels, the RP Strength channel and Mike Israel Making Progress yeah. channel. Yeah. And so we're going to dabble around and talk about a bunch of different things okay. but as i told you before we started first time i had you out i took you through my how to rank a coach test i loved it and you killed that i ranked it the lowest ever i think I ever actually ranked. was probably the highest ever <laughs> but we'll just say it was the lowest ever Beautiful. which will just segue straight into why should anyone join this discord why wouldn't you want to it's not fake it's genuine it's authentic it's well worth it. The Discord has been nothing short of meeting new people who are incredibly like-minded, giving each other a bunch of ball busting, but also being there to support each other in whatever life throws their way. The best part of it for me has also been able to connect with lifters of all levels, help coach, get coached, and also connect with other new fathers who are enjoying the journey of lifting and trying to balance that out. It's the glue that holds all of us together. A common interest will bring people from different walks of life people who are multi-millionaires, these characters and everything else in between, united under one thing, the pursuit of strength. I think most of us would agree that getting a coach is a great step forward that an athlete can make to make greater progress. But what if you had two coaches? What if you had a whole bunch of coaches and a whole bunch of driven elite level athletes and like-minded people all in your corner trying to make you better? That's exactly what you're gonna get with the Table Talk Discord crew. There's no avoiding hard training if you want to grow. But if you want to grow the most, your training needs to be hard and smart. RP Hypertrophy app will make sure you're progressing on track, monitoring and adjusting your workout at all times. So for all that work you're doing, you can be sure you're getting the best results. How do you shake yours? Element is a staple for all the elite FTS athletes. What makes it a level up from other electrolytes is its special formula, not only with sodium, but potassium and magnesium too. But what do they do? Sodium maintains fluid balance, blood flow, and boosts nerve impulse firing efficiency. Potassium works with the sodium to help regulate blood pressure and fluid balance. Magnesium supports muscle function, mood, and bone health. It helps all of us at elite FTS push ourselves harder in training. I know I personally no longer get muscle cramps in my training sessions. America Health is a premium telehealth platform specializing in hormone optimization and preventative medicine. Are you looking to optimize your health in and out of the gym, improve recovery, sex drive, and quality of life? Have you tried speaking to your health professional about this and have gotten the cold shoulder, stereotyped, or just told as part of getting older? You just go to americahealth.com backslash table talk and you can create your own lab or you can take labs that we've had set up for them, which are based upon the same labs that I've been doing over the last 15 years. Or you can use their guided optimization. With this, they'll put you in touch with a patient care coordinator, which is actually pretty cool because you get to sit down and speak to somebody that can understand what you're looking for from hormone optimization and the preventative medicine standpoint. After that conversation, they'll determine which labs that you should and which tests you should have done. And then from there, get the labs done. They'll review those labs with you and put you in touch with one of their hormone optimization specialists that can determine which supplementation that you should use over the counter or prescription. AmericHealth.com backslash table talk. The discount code is table talk. The meathead test I put together with oh, our boy. with my GPT friend. So All right. yes, now now each one of these is supposed to be worth two points. Okay. Right? How and many then, are there? Well, there's 50, but I'm not going to do all 50. 
right? Because I, I think we're going to get to the answer pretty quick. People are like, this podcast sucks. <laughs> yeah, sorry, fellas. <laughs> Zero to 20 points is you're probably not a meathead. 22 to 50 is you're an enthusiast. 52 to 70 is you definitely have tendencies. And 72 to 100 is true meathead. All right. So we're going to, some of these are kind of stupid and they're GP ish, but. That any of them that are repetitive, I'm going to put my own question in. Okay, which is going to be higher level. I'm going to pull you right, your PhD and all the exercise science. I'm going to pull you right back <laughs> into like the, the the high school weight room That's gym it. bro That's it. culture. From the 90s. I love it. That's exactly where I started. Yep. So that's, we're going to see if you're still there. All right. Right. So do you spend, <laughs> this is kind of funny, but this first one cracked me up. Do you spend more waking hours at the gym than at your home? Now, because the gym is part of your home. Yeah. That's a two. <laughs> All right. I'm in the points. <laughs> yes. Is your diet more protein than anything else? By so it is, this is where the extra science shit comes out. Technically, on average, by calories, no, because carbs dominate. But like, as far as like the most centrally important thing I eat, protein is the first thing in the conversation, and like by far the most important. Like, if there's a menu item at a restaurant that doesn't have protein, I generally just don't look at it unless I already have my protein sorted. Ooh, I'm that's gonna, like a one, maybe. I gave it a one, but I'm going to move it to 1.5. Damn, Because right. it's the highest priority. Sliding scale. Which we'll talk later, because it should be the highest priority. <laughs> right. Are your gym clothes your primary wardrobe? Ta-da! Uh, I actually, it's a fucking problem. I went to, um, I was in London, to, and one of the things we did was um, meet up with Chris Williamson, mm -hmm. who's a super, super awesome guy. And we were supposed to eat at this one place and they legitimately just didn't let me in because I was wearing like Crocs and athletic clothing. And uh, Chris like came up to the bouncer and the bouncer knew who he was. He's like, oh my God, I watch your podcast. He's like, I love it, man. Blah, blah, blah. I talked to him. He's like, dude, this guy, like he's legit. I promise. Like he's not homeless. Can you let him in? And to his immense credit, the bouncer was like, I'm sorry, Chris, we have a policy. And the entire time I was like, Chris, do not, don't say that. You don't have to, we just go somewhere else, please. So the whole thing was down the drain and we went and just like, I mean, I ate just like crap off the street really but that's a typical day for me yeah now we went to like nando's which anyone from the uk will be like oh you that really is the bottom of the barrel but i was not allowed into a restaurant because of my clothing so if now, that's if not you threw a head, jacket over the t-shirt would that work well do i did i have a jacket no well, i only had really a t-shirt right? do you wear a jacket to the gym dave no i don't exactly I don't, I don't, why would i need a jacket i think i have one jacket you mean like a suit coat like a suit coat oh god can you imagine crocs shorts and a suit jacket yeah, like, you can now you really crocs. can't I mean, they're black crocs you can kind of hide them <laughs> For, for 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 too many years, all I wore were sweatpants. Oh. So I would go to oh, these yeah. fundraisers and stuff with the nice Jordan sweatpants oh. and just have to make sure the logo, I'd yes. have to marker it black so it wouldn't stick out. Yes. Nobody knew. Because That's it was awesome. it was open like it wasn't like cuffed in the sure. angle. So it was sure. open. Yeah. So, you know, nobody ever said anything. My <laughs> wife wasn't happy about the whole thing. You're was, embarrassing us. Yeah, I just throw my funeral <laughs> coat over it. You know, Jack. Well, I got one jacket, right? It's it's for like weddings and funerals. So Same. <laughs> that's about it. Yeah. So definitely a two on that one. Yeah. Do you uh ooh, this would be do you talk about lifting more than any other topic? Yeah. Two. Do you avoid cardio for the fear of losing muscle? Don't expand on that because we're going to come back to it. Let, let me reframe that question. Have you ever avoided cardio for the fear of losing muscle? Every single day that I was drug free. <laughs> that, that is one of the, I have that later and one of the things to discuss. Is your social media filled with gym selfies or workout videos? Yes. Yeah. You're it's arguably it. filled with nothing else. <laughs> You're killing it. Do you consider, do you even lift bro a legitimate question? It's maybe the most important question man has ever asked himself. Have you ever skipped a social event because it conflicted yes. with your gym schedule? <laughs> Next. <laughs> do you carry a protein shaker with you all the time? I'm not going to say a shaker, but there's. Yes, I'm, I have, I'm packed with protein at all times. Is your idea of snack a protein bar? Is there another kind of snack I'm unfamiliar with? Yep, here we go. <laughs> and do you wear tank tops or sleeveless shirts regardless of the weather? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> do you have a, oh, no, I thought I said chest day. Do you have a cheat day that rivals Thanksgiving as far as calorie intake? 
No, no. I used to. No, I get a zero on that. Yeah, this is zero. Days. Yeah, so we're going to come back to that one. Earned zero. Do you track your macros religiously? I built an app to do that. Yeah, I went okay. way overboard. I got, on that. That's a four. <laughs> that's a four. <laughs> <clears throat> is your gym bag packed with more gear than people's suitcases, or was it packed? Because now you have your own place, so you I'll, don't really I'll, need it. I'll put it this way: when I travel for work, like going Australia or some shit like that, because I have to bring my my weightlifting shoes and Versa grips and belt, it like. The number of actual clothes I get to bring because I try to backpack everywhere mm-hmm. I go. I'm like, fuck, I have like three outfits. Mm-hmm. So, like, yes, my gym stuff takes up way too much of my bag anywhere I go. Do you quote fitness motivational phrases regularly? I'm going to say, I'm going to give you a four on that one because you create them. <laughs> I create them. <laughs> I'm do a little sarcastic <laughs> shit, but yeah. Do you meticulously plan your meals and carry them with you? Yes. Do you dis, do you express your disdain for fast food openly? No. No, I don't. I think fast food. I mean, look, like I grew up reading articles about how you guys did shit and like the whole fucking pour olive oil into a pizza mm-hmm. and fold it up. How could I just eat? That's how you get jacked is fast food. It's also how your cardiologist makes a living. But just, uh, yes, you know, as like, you find out later. Yes. I have, there, 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 there are four types of temples I'm familiar with in the United States. Church, mosque, synagogue, and Taco Bell. <laughs> and do not disparage its name. You can digest that still. Define digest. It comes out the other end. Yeah. How long does it stay in your system? 30 minutes. Yes. It's like a cleanse. Mm -hmm. (gasps) Oh, no. (laughs) Wait a minute. That's really cool. I think we just made up a new cleanse. Like, you know, Hollywood does like the fucking beetroot cleanse or whatever bullshit, the Taco Bell cleanse. They're like, there's no way this works. Try it. I get that from Kentucky Fried Chicken as well. And (laughs) a couple weeks ago, I had a colonoscopy. Uh And so you got to go through this procedure to like shit everything out. Yes. Jokingly, I asked them if I could just eat. KFC because it basically does the same thing. <laughs> they didn't find any humor in my statement. Dude. But it would have worked better when it was all I love over. it. That's half of my life is uh, interacting with people who don't know my sense of humor <laughs> and I'll make a joke. And you know me, man. I make a joke at every conceivable instance. Mm-hmm. So like for sure, I've joked with doctors before and uh, you know, usually because they're like, it's their 15th hour in the emergency room. They just deadpan you. I'm like, no, just kidding. I'm not currently on heroin. Please continue. <laughs> I do the same shit all the time. Yeah. They never find the humor in it, though. Look, e- people who don't joke, they don't find the humor in that. There's a slight probability you might cheer them up a little bit. Could be. It definitely cheers me. Is it all Right. And that, listen, 99.9% of my joke is just that, that I think is funny. I'm never making jokes <laughs> to people that I'm like, oh, I'll make this person laugh. Like, I just think it's great. Mm-hmm. I'll say it. And if they don't laugh, I'm like, yeah. Cool. Oh, well. On to the next. Move on to the next. More one. jokes until they push me <laughs> off the plane or whatever. Do you find yourself offering unsolicited gym advice or have you in the past? In the past? Jesus Christ, yes. Holy shit. That one is a, um, for, for most, that should be a evolution of their wisdom over time. Yeah. Because when you, you still see it, like we all still see it. But how you respond to it today is different than 20 years ago. One of my first articles that I ever wrote was kind of the um, the tact behind giving gym advice and unsolicited advice. Because uh, when I started to become a person that knew things in the, in the fitness world, I would go visit my friends in California who were all like uh, PhD students in neuroscience. Like they were my friends before they were PhD students and – and uh, we would go to the gym together and we would lift and, you know, they would learn kind of the basics. And, you know, like once you know the basics as a lifter, after like three weeks of lifting, you could be like, isn't that guy doing that wrong? And of course he's doing it wrong, right? And they're like, Israel, why don't you go tell that guy to do it right? And I'm like, okay, I need to write an article about this because it's like, one does not simply because if you – so first of all, if you're a male and you go tell another male what to do, he's like, the fuck out of my face. What the mm-hmm. fuck is wrong with you? Um, and also like maybe he's hurt. Maybe he's modified his range of motion for whatever other reason. There's so many other concerns. And and like towards the end – and this sounds like egotistical and cocky and shitty and whatever. I'm a dick. Fuck it. I don't mean any of this. But um, 
free advice. I mean, you got to pay for that shit, motherfucker. And by pay, I mean, at least ask me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm not trying to fucking kick dicks out of your mouth and telling you what to do in the gym. Uh, and, and it's also, it's, 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 uh, the, the bottom line is it's at the end of the day, it's really rude, like to give unsolicited anything to people outside of compliments, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, if I see an attractive girl, I'm like, damn bitch, what's up, baby? <laughs> like, that's nice to say. People mm -hmm. say it's wonderful. But, uh, outside of that, you know, like, People do it. People do what they do anyway. How many times have you given people advice that have asked for it? And they're like, oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. And they just don't take it. Mm -hmm. You do that enough. By the time you're sort of our age range, you're like, eh, if anyone wants to know anything, they can Google me. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. no, they, just they kidding. Can but seriously, they can ask me. And if they don't mm -hmm. ask me, hey, peace, love, and respect. People like, it's also not a moral infraction when you do dumb shit at the gym. Like if you're squatting super high, I don't hate you as a person. I think you're fucking dope. It's awesome. But like, if you want to come up to me, you're like, what do you think about that squat? I'd be like, I think it look pretty good. You'll probably go a little bit lower. And it, that's kind of my, my, tenor but back when i was younger oh my god dude like yeah I, I would every now and again give people unsolicited advice it never went well i got punched in the face a lot mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> i'm kidding about that last yeah, one, I, but I it did not that, go well <laughs> was that the premise of the article that you wrote the article was um the, that's exactly the premise of like should you give unsolicited advice to the gym and kind of what do you think? And I think I, from, from memory, and my memory sucks, but it was basically like if you see especially a very young or very old person doing something that can proximately get them really hurt, maybe you should say something. Yeah. Outside of that, free world. Mm -hmm. So I, I think as um, young coaches coming up, you should look. For those things, because mm -hmm. in a way, it can provide education for you. Sure, you don't need to say anything. Oh right? yes, but, but you can look yes. and see Stay inside your own head. Yes, like how could that be better? Yep. You know, or why is that working right. for them? Yes, and if I was going to tell them how to do it better, how would I say it? And if they asked mm. why, how would I justify it? Because it's really fucked up when you're like, "Hey, you should squat low," and they're like, "Why?" And you're like, "Oh, uh, because it's manly." Or huh, it's not convincing to me either. And then so you have to rationalize a little bit. So it's really good practice. Great advice, Dave. Mm -hmm. Like say it to yourself. Yeah. Do you, per, do you prefer, I'm going to take this one back. Uh, did you used to prefer free weights over machines? Like religiously. I used to think machines were the G word that we no longer say in public yes. anymore. I don't think we're allowed to say that. Mm. Or any version of that. I mean, even though happy at home and on happy. camera, I do the acts yes. myself. Yeah. So <laughs> it's machines were happy. Very happy. Yeah. Very, very happy. Uh, do you regularly consume a gallon of water per day? Almost certainly. But I don't have the gallon jug. So I don't know. Dave, I think I need one point on that and not All two. Right. Yeah. Because, you know, the, walking around with the gallon jug, that's did, burning that bro shit. Did you used to do that? No. Oh, that's good. That's good. Zero, maybe. That's good. Yeah. Are you known for loud grunting and yelling encouragement in the gym? Doesn't that how people lift weights? Yep. I've never been to a Planet Fitness because I don't want to – I respect the feng shui they have going on over there. I know I'm not welcome and I just don't go. Mm -hmm. This goes to the other one. Do you silently judge others lifting form? Yes, I'm going absolutely. to give you a four on that one because you have a you have a YouTube channel. <laughs> were we not silent? Were you? Judging? Were you? Actually, I'm gonna, we're going to go with ten. <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> we're going to take this way up. Um, I think I already passed. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I think you already did. Um, some of the like, do you celebrate your gym anniversary? Like what? Know, That's like a is. GPT question right there. Yes, for sure. yes. It doesn't know that humans don't do that exactly. Uh, do you preach about the importance of diet and exercise? I'm just going to skip through. Do you consider, uh, do you, do you consider leg day a near religious experience? I don't think near needs to be in that phrase. Yes. So we just saw one here. Oh, so yeah. I'm going to go 2.5. 2.5. Wow. You rated my leg workout a 2.5. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah, and all I saw was the end, but there was a lot of grunting, <laughs> a lot of grunting. right? And your ankle stability was really good for the lunges. Beautiful. I always looked at stupid shit like that. <laughs> shit. Exactly. There you go. You're a bro yourself <laughs> judging people and shit. Yep. Like, is it collapsing in? Is it staying stacked? It, it, it's all there. And it was going to f close to failure. Close to failure. Yep. Um, do you refer to non gym goers as civilians? Whoa. I, um, when I got into jujitsu, some of my new jujitsu and MMA friends used to call them mortals. 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 There's Mere people that mortals. fight and there's mortals. And I was like, whoa, that's elitist as fuck. But I didn't say that to them because they would beat me up. Yeah. Um, no, no, no. 
Well, this this one here. Now, yeah. keep in mind, we're going to use for the word supplements, broad base. Yes. Okay. It's a significant portion of your income spent on supplements. No, thank God. I'm not liver king. <laughs> 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 and also, real talk, real talk. Can we can we talk? Can we talk a little openly about yeah, that kind of yeah, stuff? Yeah, yeah. When I saw like the other bullshit about like how much he was paying mm -hmm. for his like growth, I was like, look, buddy, like, I'm not going to give you sources, but you could get a serostim for like one tenth that price. Mm -hmm. Whoever the fuck sold you that shit is fucking you in the ass mm -hmm. hard. That's the the first thing people are like. Oh my god, like he, he's buying steroids and growth hormone. Here's evidence of it financially. The first thing I looked at was like. $10,000. What the fuck are you buying, bro? <laughs> That's, the, same That's thing. the only part that like, yeah. what, what? That's the same thing that hit me. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, are you serious? Dude, like, <laughs> if, if you have growth that can beat Pfizer and Serastim, I want to know about it. Yes. But it doesn't exist. So mm -hmm. you're getting fucked. Mm -hmm. Good God. At least if you're going to tell people, you lie to people about drugs, don't get ripped off. You know what? Good. Good. I take it back. Good. I'm glad he got ripped off. If anyone to get ripped off, thank God it was him. And it was great public service to like younger people who shouldn't be doing drugs. They're like twenty thousand dollars of every six months. I can't afford to do drugs, and they just write it off. And you're like, well, TLDR kid, it's actually. You know what? I'm just gonna shut no, up. No, that yes, might be a good. That might be a good thing, right? Because <laughs> if you look at over the past. God, my time frame because I'm old. Say 20 years, 10, probably more 10 years. Mm -hmm. The conversation about PEDs has shifted tremendously, where before it was something that we just didn't talk about. Sure. Right. You became very good at avoiding the questions and totally. avoiding the conversation. And that was a strategy that over a period of time, a lot of people would criticize yes. because you're not being open, you're not being yes. transparent. Yes. Now people are being open and transparent, but there's a social cost associated with that. Totally. Is there's more kids using it. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that in particular? You know, yes. is it net positive sure. or negative? Because I don't know. Like sometimes yeah. I think of it and it's a negative, <laughs> and other times, you know, I shift the other way. I have a few thoughts on that. It will probably surprise no one to hear, maybe some people, that politically – I have a complex political kind of uh, situation, but I'm uh, probably most closely aligned to like libertarian, like freedom is fucking awesome. And so um, when the government decides to make voluntary activity that hurts no one except for maybe the user um, illegal – they threw the first stone. So I think that lying about steroid use in the context of shutting the fuck up about it so you don't get fucking popped is 100% ethical. It's like Nazis coming up to your door in the Holocaust. Like, do you have any Jews in there? Like, lie away. Fuck them. They're Nazis. They started the shit, right? Mm -hmm. So when people like back in the 90s, I remember seeing a thing where like Kai Green was getting interviewed on like a regular actual news station. And this was fucked, but to the very close of the segment, you know, they have like the music coming in and the guy's like, you know, asking about this and posing, blah, blah. And Kai Green, super verbose, super mm -hmm. just knocking out of the park. Everyone's laughing and they were like all right and uh we'll be back later and uh now no juice right kai and kai goes only orange bob and it was like wow that was so fucking good right on the spot it was unbelievable <laughs> but like oh yeah but you really use the steroids yeah 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 he's gonna go talk about that you fucking assholes you decriminalize it like the uk did we'll talk about it till we're blue in the fucking face now if it's decriminalized and someone's lying about it they're just lying cocksucker but if there's a criminal penalty involved Government threw the first stone on that one, man. Fuck that. Lie away. I don't ever judge. I remember I was at uh, a gym when I was really young before I used anything. And I, I, I was talking to a dude who was like, you know, like clearly using, you know, the, the redness mm -hmm. of skin. You just don't get naturally. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I was like, hey, like a guy like me, if I was to ever get into it, like, what would you start out with? It's like test, like how many milligrams are over? He looked me dead in the eye. He goes, I know nothing about that. I go, no shit. He's like, yep. And I was like, understood. I never asked him again. Then I realized later there was like a massive drug bust in the area or whatever. I was like, oh shit, that I picked the wrong time to ask that. But I never judged him a second for it. I was like, dope, because it's illegal. Now that people are speaking more openly about it, and to be completely honest, like personal use busts are insanely rare. Uh, watch me get busted tomorrow mm -hmm, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Sweet, I'll go to jail. Fuck. Right. <laughs> um, but um, now that it's more open, there's totally the downside of uh, people hearing about it more. Uh, and, and so maybe more people are using it, right? Right. However, prohibition has a really nasty track record with not discouraging use. Alcohol use rates in the United States during literal prohibition were fucking mega high because especially for young people, when something is forbidden, they're like, oh, 
oh, fuck. Because drinking when you're in college and you're under 21 is like this exhilarating experience. Mm -hmm. When you turn 21, you get drunk. And the next day, like, you want to drink? You're like, no. And you have a couple of glasses of wine with your wife when you're 50. And that's the last time you drink. Because you're like, ah. So, you know, with marijuana, when it was, it was basically decriminalized pretty much all over the United States now and legal in a bunch of places. And people were predicting, like, as soon as you fucking legalize it and you talk about it a lot, everyone's going to be a degenerate drug addict. It just never happened. So is it better for us as a matter of social policy to be open about discussing anabolics for young people to be able to contextualize? Like, look, kid, yeah, this is the thing people do, but it's going to fuck you up. This is one of the most compelling things you can tell young people is there is a huge class of anabolic steroids, subclass of anabolic steroids that will stunt your growth permanently. You're telling the motherfuckers that shit. They're like, wait, wait, what? JK, I don't need to be a fucking TikTok trend teenager anytime soon because mm -hmm. you stay a teenager forever, Peter Pan like motherfucker. But that's you can have an honest conversation then and talk about trade offs. If you just don't talk about it, it's got that allure of the forbidden. Mm -hmm. And what are the adults keeping from us? What are they keeping from us? If people don't talk about it, it must be really amazing. And then they're like, they realize that another bad thing that I think the government did with steroid policy and a bunch of other drugs, they don't talk about it in context and as, as a, a, a trade off. They're like, it's just bad. You look at what steroids do and they're like liver cancer, pimples the size of your fucking nose, your dick will fall off, you know, the usual. Mm -hmm. And then if you know people that take them at the gym, you're like, that guy has like one of the 10 side effects and he's just balding a little, but he's also 32. So maybe it's just like his dad was bald. And then you realize like, I've been lied to. And then you might tilt in the direction. I've seen this a bunch where people are like, yeah, man, all the fucking side effects are bullshit. This stuff is like fucking awesome. And you're like, mm, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. They have very serious side effects, mostly long-term ones. So by trying to keep information out of the hands of people, I generally think on aggregate over the long term, net good isn't generally the result. I think more people need more information than less. But with the information, you should be honest and open and talk about both the good stuff and be like, yeah, people take steroids because they fucking work. Like I remember when I was um, 12 years old, uh, we were had like group stuff in school and uh, one of the groups, I was in a group of like three or four people and we went to the hallway to work because like where they had to separate the groups or whatever, work on your little part of the project mm -hmm. and come back in. And one of the girls, she was like a, like a bad girl or whatever, which was, you know, I was, I was super into that. Was like, oh boy. She yeah. was in your group? 100%. She yeah. was in my group and I was, you know, shitting bricks. But her and another person started talking about like marijuana. And to me, I was like, anyone who associates with drugs is a literal criminal, a degenerate drug addict. And it's, I'm just in a different social class than these people. I don't, I don't talk to these people. And I remember asking her like, why? Why do you do it? And she's like, it feels good. And I, I didn't even have the context for that. I, I literally asked her, I was like, does it like taste like strawberries or something? Like, I didn't know that you could take mm -hmm. a substance that could change how you feel. And so, and I realized like, I thought drugs just made you an addict and a degenerate and that's all they did. So people were stupid for taking them. And only later did I realize like, well, drugs feel, some drugs feel really good to take. And some of those don't really fuck up your life. Some of them feel really good to take and they toast your life. How many recreational heroin addicts do you know? How many recreational marijuana users do you know? It's totally different. Mm -hmm. But because we have this understanding back in the 80s and 90s, you remember that shit? Where mm -hmm. like drugs, you do, you do one whiff of marijuana and you're just going to drop dead the next day. You might even catch AIDS on the way down to hitting your head on the ground and dying. Who knows? Because you told people that, they had no context, no nuance. And when they get to college and people are fucking doing drugs, they're like, wait, what the fuck? And again, they see that no one's dead. They see like people are having fun. They try them, they feel great, and then they can get into real trouble with drugs because then they rediscover for themselves like, okay, the government definitely exaggerated by a factor of 10 how bad these things were, but they're still bad for you in context. I remember I was 19 years old. I guess I'm not really outing anyone here. I went up to visit a friend at Central Michigan University. I'm sure you know where that is, roughly. Mm -hmm. It's in Michigan, in the center. It's in the central <laughs> For those yeah. who don't know. Yeah, just, <laughs> uh, look at the hand. At the hand, in the middle of the hand. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> you know you're from Michigan when you bust out the hand. Uh, and I remember walking into this party, and it was like friends of friends. You know, everyone's cool. And watch this nice uh, young woman just like bend down to the table and just do a fucking line of coke. And I was like, I am in a Colombian cartel. <laughs> oh, my God. And I watched her. Because I was like, that's it. She's going to go crazy. She's going to get irrational. She just chatted with people the whole night. Nothing happened. And I was like, somebody lied to me about this. She's like Coke from 80s movies. Like, 
mm-hmm. all right, let's sell all the company stocks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're actually around right. people who are on Coke and they're just like a little chatty than normal. And you're like, what the fuck? So for like straight up with people, like, look, Coke's going to make you feel real good when you take it. And there's a very good chance you're going to get addicted to it. It costs an obscene amount of money. It's going to fuck up your health in 50 different ways. And then when you done with your Coke phase, when you lose a shitload of money, you have to re-enroll in school. You clean up your life. 20 years later, when you're 45, you're going to die of a heart attack because that Coke cost you in a way that you can never pay back. You tell people that real shit and they're like, yeah, fuck that. Or maybe I'll do it once or twice and then fuck that. Mm -hmm. But if you're like, look, Coke is going to kill you. It's terrible. Everyone's an addict. And you see real people doing it and you're like, but that, but, but, but they're not addicts. Then you're like, fuck yeah, Coke's great. Let's do it all the time. And that's a fucking big mistake. I've heard tons of guys using gear who are like, dude, dude's the fucking awesome man. I love fucking test, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, hey, there's not really context for this. Yes, test has its advantages, but it also has mega downsides. I think honesty, context, giving people the real deal of, like, yeah, there's, there's upsides for sure, but there's mega downsides. And when you're too young, you're too fucking young. And I wouldn't do it if I were you. What more can you tell a young person than the fucking truth with that hard shit? The best movie I ever saw in regards to, you know, like you sit through middle school and they show you all these dumbass, terribly produced fucking movies about like, Bill here was a good student. And then he tried marijuana. No. Now he's homeless and he's dead in a dumpster. And you're like, Bill's an idiot. Yeah, yeah. The best movie I ever saw with regard to drugs was Train Spotting. Have you ever seen Train Spotting? Mm-mm. Train spotting is not a cautionary tale about drugs. It's just a really gnarly uh, story about uh, people in the 80s in the UK uh, and their kind of adventure, so to speak, with heroin. And do I was going to say do not watch this with your children, but man, you got kids that are like 10 or 12. And you know, because you used to be, if you're, if you're listening to this and you're a father, you're a mother, and you know, you had a wild side to you and you wish someone talked some sense into you when you were young, you know, when you're a parent, like kids don't fucking listen to you. They're mm-hmm. like, yeah, okay, whatever, dad. Mm-hmm. If your kid is like 12 years old or some shit and you think they're hardy enough to handle some nightmares, but they need some fucking real, like God's eye view of shit, train spotting the movie, watch them, watch the movie with them. Like it's heroin and it starts out, everyone's having a lot of fun. And towards the end of the movie, you're like, I'm never doing heroin ever, ever, ever. Because the kind of shit you see in that movie is two things, fucked up and realistic as hell. And you're like, nope. They show heroin withdrawal. They show, I don't want to spoil too much stuff, Mm -hmm. but like one of the guys gets like HIV and he dies from like adopting a kitten because cats produce some kind of dander or whatever that doesn't do anything to you if you don't have full-blown AIDS, but will kill you if you have AIDS. And it was like shit like that, just all the way down for two hours. That real cut of what actually happens, I think is the best education you can give kids. So like, you want your kids not to do steroids? Show them a Liver King video. Be like, you want to end up like him? Be like, no. Like, yeah. Stay the fuck away from steroids, at least the, until um, you're 25 or something. <clears throat> I'll date myself here a little bit, but when I started, you know, the, the test, would mm-hmm. come with the, the package test. insert, right? So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And on the package insert, there is a squared box that basically said this will not enhance athletic performance. I love it. Right? Meanwhile, Blame I'm looking lie. around like, uh, <laughs> wrong. <laughs> Why are we doing it? Yeah. Then? <laughs> and it's, you know, it's the package insert, right? Yeah. So, it's got all the side effects. It's got oh, everything. Yeah. So, then you're looking at that like, so is all the rest of this bullshit yes. too? Yes. You know, yes. so this is like real world stuff. You know, it was went through my head, yep. you know, at that time, like, well, this is blatantly bullshit. Yeah. Yep. You know, so all this must also that, be bullshit, you know, but it's not, that, but it's yep. not. Yep. And um, at what age or at what time do you think somebody would be prepared to be able to make that choice or decision? Uh, that's a great question. I think it also intersects with like when it's really time if to start considering it, if you're serious about strength athletics and if you have what it takes to really justify going to the next level. So for me, my my it is very context dependent, but my average age of, of discussion is about 25 years old. Because if you like have results you're not super impressed with and you're 23 and you're like, I, I think I need drugs, man. I need more gains. Like, shut your fucking mouth. You're a goddamn baby. You still got gains coming your way like crazy. If you don't have good gains coming in your fucking early 20s, dude, one of two things. One is you're doing some shit really wrong that steroids won't fix. Or two, you just have the most dog shit genetics of all time and please do not take steroids because it's going to make you just below average, but also red in the face and with 80 pimples and now your dick doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I've seen that. So, dude, I had a guy walked up to me in a gym um, and clearly I was on gear, right? At some point, everyone's like, okay, fine. And he was like five foot seven, 
Um, and I was probably about uh, 160, 165. And I'm telling you, 15 to 20% body fat, not shredded. And he just starts yapping at the mouth. It was, I thought it was curious. Nice guy. He, was, he started telling me like about how much trend he's on. And I was on trend at the time too, except I was like 225 and I had veins in my abs. And I was just like, what the fuck? I didn't say that. I was mm-hmm. like, yeah, man, trend. Ha, 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 and went to go like press. But uh, mm-hmm. I was like, this is a guy that does not need to be on trend. Whatever it is you're getting off trend, it's not enough. You don't want that many downsides, psychological, neurological health regular health, um, blowing up on people uh, over traffic disputes for whatever the fuck he got out of it. Like, trust me, 165 at 17% body fat is not worth trend. It's, I'm sorry. I'm mm-hmm. sorry. No, it's a personal value judgment. Maybe for him it was worth it. There was one of these things where you should be getting fucking awesome gains until you're at the very least 25. And then if you've been diligently training since you were a teenager, you should at least be starting to bump up to like the asymptotic phase of your natty gains. Like just starting to get a little slower gains wise. And now you kind of know like what the deal is. So for example, if you want to be an open class IFBB pro bodybuilder and at age 24 and a half, you weigh 150 pounds at 5'9", don't take steroids. Pick a, do, pick a new hobby or lift for the fucking fun of it and to fucking look amazing at the beach to regular people. And if you're like 5'9", 155 and you're shredded, that's about as good looking as you'll ever get to normal people. No one thinks you're gross. Everyone thinks you're great. But if you are 215, with a six pack at five, nine at 24 and a half, and you want to be an open pro, you probably have what it takes and then make an intelligent, calculated decision. Talk to a medical professional, do it hopefully in the United Kingdom where it is decriminalized and, uh, and then go to town. Um, but until you're, it, to me, it's more about how many years you've put into the sport drug free and not how old you are, but the age absolutely plays a factor. There's actual mm-hmm. science to support this, a uh, full, like uh, full neurological development on a grand scale, like brain structures visible in just an MRI, doesn't occur for most people until their mid twenties. And so you're, and and the last thing that forms in a human is typically like the prefrontal cortex area, as far as I understand, and that's the one that is uh, concerned with making decisions based on pure logic and decisions based on long time horizons, trade offs. Mm-hmm. And like when I was eighteen years old, bro. I don't know what my time horizon was like the next minute Mm -hmm. (laughs) when I was 22, it was like the next day. (laughs) I'm kidding. But some shit like that. When I was in my mid to late twenties is when I, I first, now that I look back on how my thought patterns were, that's when I became me. That's when I became an adult. And that's when I was first prepared for decisions. Like, should I use gear? I started when I was like, 27, like a month or two shy of when I was 27. And to me, that was a really good time to start. I knew guys, great friends of mine that started when they were 20 and started when they were 22. Most of them are not gear anymore. They don't do strength sports anymore and they fucking regretted it. Some of them went on to be world champions and they loved it. But for the average person who's thinking about using gear, do you want to use the example of a guy that had everything right, genetically, everything else and became a world champ? Sure. Are you Chris Bumstead? Unlikely. So should you start steroids nice and early like he did? If you have the right stuff, you have the right crew behind you, you're already unreal mature at age 21 and you have all the genetics and everyone's like, dude, you're going to be like blah, blah, blah. It's all good. And you want to be a drug using guy because here's another thing in bodybuilding and powerlifting, et cetera, the drug free side of the thing is blowing up like crazy, bro. Mm -hmm. Social media, people give a shit. They care if you're drug free or not. And the drug side is like less and less allure and more and more like, so you drug free? You're like, no. And they're like, that sucks. And they walk off. You're like, I did this to fit in and Mm -hmm. no one likes me. So you may very well consider just never using steroids. Even if you want to be the best at what you do, just stay drug free. Like USAPL powerlifting and shit like that, IPF, like those people are, most of them are actually drug free. Mm -hmm. I know I'm going to get a lot of shit. No, but I would agree with you. I, I, I I would go as far as to say most competitive powerlifting, if we opened up open powerlifting, Mm -hmm. And we downloaded the whole database mm-hmm. and whatever that mm-hmm. is, the majority are drug free. Yeah. Which is crazy because you look at their numbers nowadays and you're like, I am nothing and no one. Mm-hmm. These are gods. You got girls squatting 450 pounds at like 120 and you're like, what? That's a good squat for an enormous man. Mm-hmm. And I guess it's a French girl who's completely drug free and she's 19. And you're like, kill me. It's like when you watch Chinese weightlifting, you're like, I don't I even mm-hmm. lift weights. This is pointless. So the drug free side is so awesome now that like, Maybe you shouldn't do gear at all, but if you're going to do it, what I want people to understand is 
it's a big deal. It's a big, big decision. It's not, I really don't like, there's an attitude that other countries have to it or other cultures and no disrespect. It's just another way of doing things. I don't personally like it, but it's got its upsides. I know I'm going to get shit for this, but fuck it. The Arab world, the European world, a lot of the people there are like, you need to get in shape for a music festival. You take fucking VAR and trend. That's just what you do. It's leisurely. And these are real powerful drugs. Treat them with a little bit of reverence. Wait till you're a bit older, till you're a bit wiser. They're also, for most people, a means to an end. They're not fun to take for their own shit. Like, there are fun aspects of it. Like, when you're on a ton of gear and you've never felt confident in your life, maybe middle school didn't go well for you, you got beat up a lot, you're going to feel confident. And that feels nice. But then when you have enough confidence, like true confidence underneath you, you just feel anxious and needlessly aggressive all the time. Like you're at the store and some guy looks at you and fuck's he looking at? Like that's your first thought. You're like, I don't want to have these thoughts anymore. He's just some guy. What the fuck is going on? The health stuff, the health scares, the anxiety, the aggression, the neuroticism. Dude, this shit's it's fucked up, dude. Like it's not fun to do this shit. Are the results cool? Yeah, they're fucking sweet. That's why people do them. But people are like, oh man, I can't wait to jump on. Like, trust me, you can wait to jump on. Now that I'm kind of wrapping up my bodybuilding career in the next couple of years, I can't wait to get off. I'm tired of the shit. Mm -hmm. There is uh, a broader Chavez, one of my mentors in the kind of gear side of things, uh, calls it the burden. Like, you know, when you're on like, I've never been up this high, but his example was like, when you're on three grams of total gear and you have to eat 6,000 calories every day mm -hmm. and make five hard workouts a week, ain't nobody having fun anymore. Mm -hmm. You're like an astronaut riding up in a rocket at like nine G's. No one's like, this is fun. They're like, mm -hmm. this is how it feels all the time. And you're like, it's an, I'm on a mission to get it done. But I think people from TikTok or whatever have this idea that the, the after picture is just how it feels the entire time. You got cheeseburgers, you do this, you got yeah. your clan abs yeah. and like you're the man. And that is a very small part of it. It is definitely a part of it. It's cool. But there's some bad shit in there. And well, it, don't it, rush to yeah, do that. There's... When I was still competing, you know, it's whatever my dose was, you know, at the time. Sure. Max, it was whatever I went to total. So I'll just put that out there. No logic to that whatsoever. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> How much but, that you have a scale of like, what's my total? What's my gear yeah. dose? It's a straight yeah. line. You're like, oh, that's a lot of trend. All right. <laughs> I got to the point that I, I hated taking the shit. Yeah. Because after decades of doing it, it's like, oh, God, I got to do this again. Again. So I put these white coffee cups in my walk-in closet with Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday on each one, and I'd preload the whole week. Yep. And every fucking time, I would take it from Monday and put it in a Tuesday. i just do it tomorrow. Oh, fuck. It here, and then it ended up being like, oh, fuck, they're all on Friday. Yeah. And it's, it's counterproductive to what I was trying to accomplish at the time. Yeah. But at the same time, it's mentally exhausting. Like, oh, God, I got to do this again. Yep. That it's... <clears throat> There's and their long side long term side effects are real. You know, I've been around long enough to know people who have been on long enough to know not everyone's that, doing well. Yes, and now most in transparency, most of them won't blame it on that. Sure, they'll blame it on nine thousand other things. Sure, and leave that one. I'm curious, <laughs> right? yeah, very interesting how that all kind of transpires and yeah. works through that whole yeah. thing. Where with um the with the people getting on. I look at it kind of two different ways that if they get on too soon and they haven't maximized their their training, mm -hmm. you know, their nutrition, mm -hmm. their ability to recover, the mm -hmm. big rocks, mm -hmm. and then they just go on. And then when the gains start to slow, as they will, mm -hmm. then their answer is more. Sure. Right? Now, if they learn those things first, you know, how to periodize their training, how to eat, how to re recover, they're eventually still going to have to do it anyhow. Yes, but 10 years later. Yes. And then they'll have to do it for five years less total. Like being over one or two grams of total gear is some shit you want to do as little as possible in your life. So if you gain most of your muscle drug free before you're 25, and then you do a couple of years of cowboy shit, dope. You win your medals, you do your trophies, you turn pro, do whatever the fuck it is you were going to do. Statistically, most people will do nothing of the sort. I haven't turned pro. I'm fucking nobody. I've been doing this shit for 10 years or mm -hmm. something like that. Um, but the less time you have to do that for, the better. 
because the total area under the curve of how much gear you put into your body is absolutely a huge factor for a few things. One is longevity. Another one is morbidity, which is like you can live a long time, but you're going to live in really poor health because of what you did for yourself, which is from people I understand have talked to on a personal level of high morbidity conditions, diabetes and shit like that. You, the difference between living and dying is very marginal at that point. It's like, yes, I'm alive technically, but this ain't it. Mm-hmm. And also, there's some pretty convincing literature that at least acutely and at least certain kinds of intelligence are reduced by anabolic steroids. And there is absolutely a dose response and total duration relationship. So if you take, uh, for a few years, less than a gram of gear, it's statistically undetectable. If you take five to 10 grams of gear for 10 years, you're going to drop your IQ by like a standard deviation. Now, certain types of IQ, if you come off, it's a little better, blah, blah, blah. There's nuance there. So it's not terrible news. Fuck, man, intelligence, man. You, you, I promise you don't want to fuck with that. Mm-hmm. That's so much more valuable than any amount of fucking muscle you can have on your goddamn body. Like I made all this fucking money, whatever, 18 trillion Lamborghinis that I own at this point. <laughs> Some of it was because I was jacked. Most of it's because... I got a brain or some shit like mm-hmm. that. Like I'm not that jacked, you know what I mean? Uh, so you, these are me- mega serious costs. And so if you want to play the game, fine. Get to the biggest natural size you can get to in your mid to late 20s. And then the steroids and shit are the icing on the cake to take you across the finish line. And if you want to keep dabbling all the way to age 40, dope. Fire away. But if you started gear, and I know people like this, no disrespect, we're all on our totally different journeys. I know guys that started gear when they were 16. Dave, what kind of triggers are you supposed to pull at 25 and you can't total what you want to total? You already mm-hmm. been on gear for fucking nine years. Look like a goddamn old man. And you can see it in people's faces too. You ever see gear age people visibly in the face? <laughs> like it, it occurs like cycle to bridge, cycle to bridge. When you're bridging, gear you're like age eight years. People. <laughs> dude, <there's, laughs> when you're off cycle or like on TRT, people are like, did you, did you, did you get five years younger? And then like you're in contest prep, you're on trend and people are like, you don't look so good. You're like, I don't feel so good. God damn it. I feel exactly as old as I look. And some of that aging effect goes away when you get off. It doesn't all go away, man. DNA damage, all that crazy shit, neurotoxicity. Like I said, there's gnarly, gnarly shit under the hood. Sometimes it's the price of drawing the sword and that's cool. But you don't get an eight-year-old a sword and send him to battle. Mm-hmm. Wait till he's an adult. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of my biggest stand on the pedestal and yell at these goddamn TikToking teenagers. <laughs> like, guys, yeah, steroids are dope. They're fucking sweet and they make you fucking jacked, but they come at a fucking gnarly price. And you're going to pay that price just when you start to like your life best. Because as maybe you're familiar with, being young is fucking sweet. I had a good time when I was young. But when you're older, you know who you are as a person. You know what you like and don't like. You have the financial independence in most cases to get what you like and not what you like. Um, You have a group of friends that are true friends, loyal friends, people you can count on, people you can trust, people you love. You have a spouse. I don't have them, but people tell me that children are like the greatest thing that ever happened to you. And now, when you were 19, you did a bunch of gear thoughtlessly and you're like, fuck it, YOLO. And now, you're 37 and you're holding your baby girl that's two months in your hand, in your arms and you know your last labs came back and the doctor's like, we might have to do heart surgery because this isn't good. What you saying to yourself now, motherfucker? That's when the shit's going to hit you. Just when you like your life the best. I was actually, we were, uh, Mr. Nick Shaw and I, the, uh, the CEO of RP, back when we were nothing and no one. Well, at the end of the day, we're still nothing and no one. We uh, we all jack off in a in a bathroom at night by ourselves at the end of the day. So literally, that's how I end all of my days. The bathroom. Oh yeah. Oh, we can get into the technicalities of where to jack off and not jack off. But people who jack off in their beds are disgusting animals. It flies everywhere. Where you sleep, your pillow on. Anyway, just yeah. JK. So the shower. Yeah, but you gotta stand up to do it. You know? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. You know, my lower back's fucking cramping. I'm on D ball. Mm-hmm. Um. Just trying to visualize you leaning against the counter. Dave, how <laughs> dare you? You dog. I got I got an OnlyFans. I got to charge you for what you're fucking mm-hmm. sh- You got to pay for the shit. You mm-hmm. can't visualize it in your mm-hmm. head. Get those thoughts out of your head, Dave. How dare you? But uh, I'm trying. I'm trying. I, 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 they keep coming back. Ah! <laughs> so uh, I was kind of like, um, I was, uh, Nick and I were personal trainers in New York City, and we personally trained people at a, at a studio, and in, in the vast majority of the people were like phenomenally wealthy at a level we just couldn't relate to. Like some, we had a few billionaires, that were regular clients, legit billionaires, and like everyone else was a millionaire, and there were a couple hundred thousand heirs that everyone else considered like, oh, those are just regular people. We're like, what? At the time, I made like 
$35,000 a year. Yes, living in Manhattan. It was fun time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like I was going through kind of a little bit of a rough time where I was like, kind of in between figuring out who I was. And I was having a day where I wasn't so happy. And I was um, uh, sitting next to Nick was training one of our friends who's a hedge fund manager who was at the time probably worth like 40 million. Now he's worth like infinity or some shit. And he was in his early 40s. And he was like, dude, what's up? And I was like, yeah, I'm just like, you know, I'm down. And he's like, I wouldn't worry about that. And I was like, well, what do you mean? He's like, let me tell you something. No one's going to tell you this. I'll tell you this. He goes, your 20s suck. Your 30s are better. Your 40s are going to be amazing. I don't know what kind of crystal ball he had, but he was fucking right. Mm -hmm. And so when you're young, it's easy to think, this is the time of my life. And most people report increasing levels of calm and happiness throughout their lives, well into their 60s, until morbidity and terrible medical conditions steal that. And if they don't, people report their best calm and serenity and happiness until the day they die. Great news, right? Mm -hmm. Not great news if you fucking flushed your life down the toilet doing a, a, a gram of trend for five years between age 20 and 25. And so, yeah, you can make those trade-offs, but life is fucking awesome and it gets better and better and better. And if you're like, yeah, whatever. Who gives a shit what happens when I'm 40 or older? Like that shit is going to come up on you quick. You're going to wake up and you're 39. And you're like, oh, oh, I got to pay for all that shit now. So another one of my kind of rants to the youth is like, think long term. You're going to be around for that shit. And then you're going to wish you hadn't done some of the shit you did, man. Mm -hmm. I, oh, I agree. You know, think, <clears throat> think of, I'm trying to figure out how to formulate this because it was kind of my own journey i don't like mm -hmm. the word because it reminds me of the band and the, the band, band is so that. good the best right yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. i'm kidding yeah yeah <laughs> i guess first, first time everyone. yes yes but <laughs> it's every it's just whatever with that it's i knew just don't I was, stop I was smart, smart, yeah yes just don't <laughs> so that, be a believer keep believing <laughs> is and i kind of i knew what the long-term consequences were mm -hmm. or could be mm -hmm. And weighed those and was still willing to do it. Same you here. Know? And I don't know how many do that though. And uh, it's a few. It's, yeah, a few. Um, but it's more, e it's easier to do that now because there's people that are on the other end of that. Yes. You know, to say, okay, here were the costs. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm okay with paying that. Did you have you people know? in your life who were older who could guide you in that direction or no? No, oh, God, they're en enablers. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. West Side. What am oh, I saying? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was later in life that I realized I need realist yeah. and enablers. Yes. I need a balance of the two. Sure. Like, here's this idea, and it's dumb as fuck, right? <laughs> and somebody, yeah, that's awesome. Let's just right. double down. And then yeah. somebody else, like, ah, hold up. <laughs> you know, maybe you want to consider, like, okay, let me give me a couple days. Yeah. Let me kind of ponder this through and sure. see how this kind of plays sure. out. And um, there may have been. You know, to be honest, there may have been, but I didn't listen. Yeah. You know, because you're in your 20s, you're not going to listen anyhow. Totally. You know, so I'm, I'm doing a disservice to people that may have been there, you know, sure. being able to say, what the hell is this? Why sure. are you doing this? Um, I didn't care. You know, and that's yeah. that weird, that weird age where your brain still isn't developed. Totally. And if you can, if you can, um, to me, delaying steroid use until you're old enough to contextualize it properly is similar to how to treat your brain when you're drunk as fuck at a party with relation to drunk driving. Um, you just, you don't have to think through it, but before you drink, you have to put the seed into your mind. It doesn't matter how I feel or what I think. Drunk driving is dumb as fuck. So when you're eight beers in and someone's like, you guys want to go to Taco Bell? <laughs> And you really think of saying, I'll drive. You're like, wait, nope, nope. That'd be really stupid. And I feel great, but I know that's wrong. I'm not able to make a good decision right now. And good news, I already made it. The answer is no. That's a good way to do the whole drunk. You know, like people go to a party and they collect everyone's keys and hide them. Mm -hmm. Great idea. I would think of doing that with my decision to do steroids if I was like listening to this and I was 19 years old. Like, you know what? I'm going to put that key away for a while. When I'm 25, I'll look at the key again. But for now, I know I'm not able to make that decision. And guys, I promise you, I'm not fucking with you. If you're 19 listening to this, when you're 25, there's a high probability you're going to be, thank 
God, I listened to that shit mm -hmm. and delayed it. There is a probability that you're going to be like, that guy took six years of good steroid use away from me. Damn you. Mm -hmm. I could have been Mr. Olympia. But that probability is low. And all we can ever do in life is run the probabilities and, and hedge our bets. So, Well, they can use that time. And the, the message I put out there, they can use that time to better educate themselves yes. on how to make progress, how yes. to make gains, because their passion's through the roof. Yes. They love it at a level that... I don't want to say that we don't love it at that level yes. anymore, but sure. it's different. Yeah, it's all consuming. Yes. Uh, another interesting thing about steroids, it seems to be pretty well supported scientifically. Or there's at least inklings of it that seem convincing. And this is a, a hat tip to um, my friend Menno Henselmans. If he's ever in the United States, it would be awesome to have him on the podcast. He's a fucking wealth of knowledge. Uh, it actually looks like a very large effect of steroids is dose dependent and quite rapid. So what I mean by that is if you have two people, one person got to be a drug-free 200 pounds and the other person started steroids way earlier, let's say they're identical twins, same regimen, same training, blah, blah, blah. And the guy who's on steroids already is 230 pounds because he's been running gear for a little while, a few years. Same body fat, whatever. When you are that 200-pound drug-free person because you've put all the work under the hood, myonuclear domain, all that shit, satellite cells, when you decide to hop on gear, merely months, at most a couple of years, you're basically going to be caught up to another guy that's been fucking running and gunning for a long-ass time. If you work up to impressive dosages, you pack on so much muscle so goddamn fast that you don't need to start steroids when you're earlier because can they enhance the training process? Yeah. But most of the effect seems to be like, it actually happens pretty goddamn quick. Now, if you want to be big for a long time, yeah, take steroids for a long time. You can be jacked a long time. But most people, I don't think, want to be jacked a long time. They want to make something of their physique that's truly grand. Do some competing, do some flexing in the mirror, and then come off and have a family, blah, blah, blah. You can get that quick. And you can get it anytime you want. A really good living example of that is Kai Green, who I, I've been led to believe only started steroids when he was like 32. And I was already a bodybuilding fan and Kai Green won his pro card drug free. And he weighed, I think like 210 or 215 pounds at 5'7", 5'7 and a half. I remember when he started steroids because the next time he stepped on stage was like a year later and he was 235 on stage. And then two years later when he put Slynn and growth into the equation, he was 270 on stage. And all these dumb motherfuckers have been juicing for years and years and years, weighing 230, 240 and like, fuck that 210 pound guy, what an idiot. He just caught up to them so goddamn quick because the shit happens fast. So if you think like, man, I need to be juicing for 10 fucking years to build a good physique, bullshit. You'd be training hard and getting your natural genetics maxed out. And when and if you decide to jump on, the shit will happen for you real goddamn quick. So what is the mechanism that's creating that? To be honest, a lot of it is intracellular water. Like a lot of the size you have on gear is just intramuscular water. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, a, a very astonishing amount of that is intramuscular water. And if you use insulin and growth hormone, it's even more than that. Mm -hmm. And so you'll have guys like, you've seen like pro bodybuilders come off cycle and you're like, is that guy sick? Is he going to die? He competes at 250. He's 220 pounds right now and he's kind of soft. He's not on gear. He puts the gear back in. He fucking regains all the quote unquote muscle. But a lot of that's not muscular tissue. It's just intramuscular water, which mm -hmm. is dope. I mean, it, it is muscle at that point, but it's a bit of a different thing. And so that's, that's one of the things. Another one is when uh, drugs are so powerful that they grow so much muscle so fast that when you're on them for a few years at high doses, that's about as big as you're going to get on that dose. Remember earlier you said like I was going to total whatever my dose was? Mm -hmm. There's a very similar thing going on with gear and how big you are. Like if you're 250 and you want to be 300, you just peg the scale high and you'll say four grams it is. Yeah, you'll get to 300 and you'll be lean too. But if you come off, you're not 300 anymore and you don't get to keep a whole lot of that because the stuff that was keeping the anabolism high and the catabolism low isn't in your system anymore. You go super catabolic, your anabolism is muted as hell, you lose a bunch of muscle. At the very extremes, that's how it happens. So steroids are really more of, now they do give you long-term gains, but the long-term gains I would say is 
my general estimate is like something between 25 and 40 percent of that muscle weight is real long term muscle gain that if you come off, you get to keep. More of it, much more, is that's just what you're like in the moment. It's like if um, Superman's real strong, right? But you give that motherfucker some kryptonite and all of a sudden he's a fucking bitch. But, but what about all the Superman muscles? You take the kryptonite away, he's strong again. Something very similar happens with steroids. Not 100%, but more than most people think, which means that if you can't wait to be 240 and veiny, but you get to 210 pounds with some abs drug-free, a couple of years away, you'll, you'll get there. You do not need to crank the shit for 10 years. I wish I hadn't. Another thing is once you get on a ton of gear, like let's say you get up to about a gram of gear, just on average, you'll get a huge fraction of those gains within the first year or two. After that, you're back to natty gains, except you're on drugs. And so you thought like, this is going to put pounds and pounds of muscle on my body every single year. Bullshit. You got to go up in dose for that reason. And also, you want to give yourself a, a good window. I like it when for 10 years, I can escalate the doses slightly, staying in a safe range and get awesome, consistent gains. It protects your joints too, because you don't just like fucking rocket ride. I don't want to a situation in which when I was 28, I took two and a half grams. That's the biggest leanest I've ever been. And then now I'm 38 and uh, I've never really matched that because I just tried to do it with 750 migs. You're not going to do it with 750. It takes two and a half grams to do that shit. So if you put all those puzzle pieces together, delaying drugs until you really want to pull that trigger makes more and more sense. Mm -hmm. And another thing is when you're drug free and uh, lifting, especially to get strong in the five to 10 rep range and lower rep ranges even more, you build connective tissue strength and integrity. When you get on gear, especially some kinds of gear that you use, trend specifically, makes your muscles big and strong and your tendons really weak and frail. And it multiplies your probability of injury. If you started doing trend when you were fucking 19, you were waiting to break into fucking pieces. So with that, does it, does it do both? I mean, it, are there... When you say the tendons become weaker, are they weaker just because the muscles are stronger and bigger, or are they actually tran and a few compromised? Other, yeah, a tran and a few other categories of, of steroids have a, a net compromising effect on tendon integrity, as far as I've read. Mm -hmm. And uh, fuck that. <laughs> so if you're really big and strong naturally, like I did most of my heaviest lifting objectively when I was drug free, and there's videos on YouTube to prove it. And when you look at my physique, you're like, yeah, he was drug free. I can tell you that. <laughs> Fat mm -hmm. piece of shit. Uh, so, like, I never really got hurt majorly when I got on because I never really did freaky shit. Um, if you're a power lifter, it's different. Then, like, you have bigger balls than I do because when it always scares me to watch power lifting because limit weights, especially on drugs, You've been to the WPO mm -hmm. Super Finals a few times, mm -hmm. right? Like every other dude tears his quad or tears mm -hmm. his groin. Um, but like, especially for bodybuilding and just getting big and jacked and strong, the more you can get out of it drug free, the less damage you have to do to yourself. You'll still get up to that fucking razor's edge of, of beating everyone. You don't have to put in years and years of work on gear to be your best. Just a few years will do if you have an awesome natural base. And then you're basically right in the mix. Mm -hmm. And you can always take more if you want. But then you could be like, yeah, like for five or six years, I really rode that fucking razor's edge and did all the shit and took tons of slid and growth and blah, blah, blah. I got what I got done. And it was really five years of cranking it. And like another three years before that of like low doses, just kind of playing around. That's dope. But if you're like, yeah, I do the thing. Someone's like, how long does it take? Like 35 years of drug use later. And like, Jesus Christ. That's when it comes back to mm -hmm. another conversation of like, I wouldn't bet on you living super long. Mm -hmm. Your 60s might be interesting. Yeah. Or they might be you're in a fucking wheelchair and you fucking need an IV bag to walk around or you're fucking dead. And that's that's real, real. And mm -hmm. people don't like to talk about it for understandable reasons. But when you're young, you can pretend it's never going to happen. When you're older and you've done shit that you might mm -hmm. not regret, but kind of like I paid the price. I'm good with it between me and God. It's all good. But you may want to tell other young people like, look, yeah, I did it. It worked. It was great. But looking back on it for my life now, I kind of want to live my life now a lot. Mm -hmm. And I, I might have like squeezed, in a sense, steroids and stuff, squeeze, uh, they take your life from later in your life and they double your life force earlier in your life. Yeah. It's like a transfer effect. Yes. And uh, that's a gnarly, gnarly deal with the devil. Yeah. Is it worth it? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Um, is it something you can calculate that's definitely worth it when you're 16 years old? Possible, but unlikely. It's different, right? Because I can speculatively say it probably took 10 years of my life 
Yeah. Right. Where yeah. now, you know, at 56, yeah. it, it's, oh, a, yeah. it's a little different perspective oh, yeah. than when you're 25. Yeah. So you're, you're an executive, a longtime executive of a company. You're Caucasian. You're large. You're from Ohio. A lot of you motherfuckers drop at 65, bro. Mm -hmm. The classic CEO death. You're fired. A uh, yeah. big heart attack, drop dead. Done. Right? Like yeah. you're not a fucking Asian woman. Yeah. You're I mean, well, the average is 78. Yes. And things I've done through my life take that away. It's pretty basic math to pretty basic figure math. out where this is going to go. Yes. You yes. Know, and then- And you could be an exception. Better. Totally yeah. happens. Yeah. But you could be not an exception. Or, and, you know. and you could be- People forget that there's exceptions on both ends. Mm -hmm. I mean- People croak way fucking earlier. People croak in their fucking 30s. Mm -hmm. They croak in their 40s for sure. And um, like I'm trying to ride it out a couple more years here to like really put a physique on stage that I can be comfortable retiring and be like, I really did my fucking shit. Seems to be like I'm on track now from this current prep. Like I'm looking pretty cool and pretty big, blah, blah, blah. But as soon as I get that awesome physique, one or two shows, I'm out, man. I'm out. You're going to see a new Dr. Mike if I'm still alive. I'm going to be like 170 to 190. And lean, but not super jacked. And like I've had enough because I'm interested in seeing what the future looks like. And that's not everyone's trade-off. It's not everyone's choice. And adults can make that choice. If you want to fucking ride into the wind at age 55 on three grams of shit, my man, I'll watch that sailing boat go by, uh, crashes into yeah, something. Yeah. But um, an informed choice, no matter what the choice is, is always better than an uninformed choice. And when you're young, you are literally incapable of making the kind of informed choice that the older version of you would be like, yeah, I knew what I was doing. Dave, how many times do you look back when you're age 16 and you're like, I knew what I was doing? <laughs> Who can say that? And if you can say that, you're either delusional or you're like preternaturally intelligent and like had your life mapped out. Some people are like that. No, I wasn't. Not, I mean, either, no. bro. Holy shit. No. Like, and I was like, on a technical level, like IQ testing and stuff, I was a brilliant 16 year old. But like a brilliant 16 year old is a funny way to say that, you know, that's like a really tall, short person or some shit like that. <laughs> or I'll say it, fuck it, we're allowed to have jokes, right? Mm -hmm. Really good Jewish athlete. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I know some Jewish MMA guys that probably kill me when I see them next. Mm -hmm. Easy fellas. But you know, it's like, um, you're going to want to have waited. You're going to want to have waited nine times out of 10. Mm -hmm. That's my best message to young people. So with, with these questions, I would say that you're, you're true meathead. You know, Thank you. So I don't need to I go thought all the all nuance these. about steroids erased all my meathead points. You're like, nuance. No, that's lame. <laughs> no, because we already established that there. So <laughs> enough protein shakes yes. that I'm good. <laughs> so now I've listened to enough podcasts of where you're the guest on there where people are asking you the best exercise for each body part. It's mm -hmm. like this current theme that happens in every podcast you want. Cool. Are we going to do gonna that go again? Different. <laughs> I'm going to go different. I'm going to go, what are the worst exercises per body oh. part, right? All so right. We'll start, yeah. So we'll start with chest, just hypertrophy based, not strength based. Excellent. Just hypertrophy based. Excellent. The worst movements for your chest. Excellent. Is it okay? That is still a chest movement. Okay. All right. So you can't okay. say like, like lab press, pulled out. Like fucking asshole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, is it okay if I eat really quick yep, and then we yep. get back to it? Yeah. Awesome. Let's take a break awesome. real quick. Thank you. Why should anyone join this discord? Why wouldn't you want to? It's not fake. It's genuine. It's authentic. It's well worth it. The discord has been nothing short of meeting new people who are incredibly like-minded, giving each other a bunch of ball busting, but also being there to support each other in whatever life throws their way. The best part of it for me has also been able to connect with lifters of all levels, help coach, get coached, and also connect with other new fathers who are enjoying the journey of lifting and trying to balance that out. It's the glue that holds all of us together. A common interest will bring people from different walks of life people who are multi-millionaires, these characters and everything else in between, united under one thing, the pursuit of strength. I think most of us would agree that getting a coach is a great step forward that an athlete can make to make greater progress. But what if you had two coaches? What if you had a whole bunch of coaches and a whole bunch of driven elite level athletes and like-minded people all in your corner trying to make you better? That's exactly what you're gonna get with the Table Talk Discord crew. There's no avoiding hard training if you want to grow. But if you want to grow the most, your training needs to be hard and smart. RP Hypertrophy app will make sure you're progressing on track, monitoring and adjusting your workout at all times. So for all that work you're doing, you can be sure you're getting the best results. How do you shake yours? Element is a staple for all the elite FTS athletes. 
What makes it a level up from other electrolytes is its special formula, not only with sodium, but potassium and magnesium too. But what do they do? Sodium maintains fluid balance, blood flow, and boosts nerve impulse firing efficiency. Potassium works with the sodium to help regulate blood pressure and fluid balance. Magnesium supports muscle function, mood, and bone health. It helps all of us at Elite FTS push ourselves harder in training. I know I personally no longer get muscle cramps in my training sessions. America Health is a premium telehealth platform specializing in hormone optimization and preventative medicine. Are you looking to optimize your health in and out of the gym, improve recovery, sex drive, and quality of life? Have you tried speaking to your health professional about this and have gotten the cold shoulder, stereotyped, or just told as part of getting older? You just go to AmericaHealth.com backslash table talk and you can create your own lab or you can take labs that we've had set up for them, which are based upon the same labs that I've been doing over the last 15 years. Or you can use their guided optimization. With this, they'll put you in touch with a patient care coordinator, which is actually pretty cool because you get to sit down and speak to somebody that can understand what you're looking for from hormone optimization and the preventative medicine standpoint. After that conversation, they'll determine which labs that you should and which tests you should have done. And then from there, get the labs done. They'll review those labs with you and put you in touch with one of their hormone optimization specialists that can determine which supplementation that you should use over the counter or prescription. AmericHealth.com backslash table talk. The discount code is table talk. Okay, so we're back, and the question is the worst exercises for chest. Okay, so let me do my science bullshit and put this in context. Yeah, we need some context. Yes individualization is super critical, super key. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to share exercises that are twofold. One on biomechanical grounds from what we understand on average, not the best choice, arguably one of the worst. And two, just like personal pet peeves of mine that I fucking hate (laughs) and and they suck for me. They could be for some people quite decent and even good exercises. So this is not like, oh, for sure, this sucks. Yeah, yeah. Just for folks that are going to get in the comments and say, blah, 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 worked for me. Like, we already know. Feel free not to comment. Just kidding. Comment mm-hmm. away. Yeah, you know comment I mean? away. Comment away. Yeah. That's the whole point of this. Right. Yes. Is, is to get the negative comments. That's, oh, that's, oh, shit. I can say a lot more. <laughs> yep. JK, guys, I take that back. There's no nuance. Whatever <laughs> exercise I say, I'm right. You're dumb. Fuck you. <laughs> comment away. <laughs> so, chest. Okay, Dave, I have to ask, exercises people use regularly or can I just talk about exercises people typically don't do in the context of muscle growth? Because like eight board pressed would be my first but like, I would no say, one does yeah, that. Yeah, I would that. say exercises that people generally yeah. do. Cool. Right? So that opens yeah. it up a little mm-hmm. bit more than mm-hmm. the eight board, but would still keep in something like a sure. floor press. Floor press. That would be my uh, – it's not my like for sure number one choice because mm-hmm. I have a couple other candidates, but floor press has to be a good choice because we know very convincingly now that the bottom deep stretch is probably the most muscle growth promoting part of the range of motion and the floor press completely eliminates that. Um, the floor press is an amazing exercise as an assistance lift to powerlifting and has um, – and also an amazing exercise for people who have elbow and shoulder problems that can't do full range of motion. I mean it's just God's greatest gift to those folks. But for just raw muscle growth, if you're healthy, if I see you floor pressing, I just assume you don't know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Now the next one. What's another one? For chest? Yeah. Uh, we don't. So I know. So there's going to be yes. more than one worst. Yes. Okay, one. great, great. Um, because we'll have we'll have pressing, then you're going to have you know adduction, right? Sure. So, um, we could break it down like that. I got another exercise for chest. If we do two, one or two for each yeah, group, yeah, I can definitely yeah. do this. Um, the one at a time dumbbell press. Finish. Finish. It's some football bullshit people do, some football coach <laughs> shit, because you only push with one arm, brother. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I get it. But you can save a lot of time and a lot of effort by pushing with two arms at the same time, and then your O-line coach is supposed to teach you how to push people around. That's his job. Do the thing that you're supposed to do. Like, you don't put soy sauce on your dessert. You put it on your sushi. 
that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. You're not just like, so it makes everything better. So not every movement in the weight room is supposed to be ultra sport specific. And for sports, maybe there's context to that. But a lot of people, what they do is they like learn how to lift weights from some dog shit football coach in like South Florida. Fl South Florida people, no offense, just randomly picking on a state. Floridians are great sense of humor. They take it. Mm -hmm. No one well, ever it can't be a no, Michigan high school no, coach. Sure. Too. Best coaches in the world. God damn it. No way. <laughs> Michigan got, hey, since Michigan won the fucking national champions, yeah. how dare you? I know. Um, but, uh, People like do this thing where they learn how to lift for sport in high school and then they just assume like this is lifting and that's how it always works. And then their mission in college and after turns to be like, I just want to be jacked. But then they still do football shit. Like you see people in college weight rooms who do not involve themselves in athletics anymore doing like hand cleans and power cleans. Like that's not going to get you pussy at frat parties, bro. Mm -hmm. Nobody gives a shit what the fuck you can like wide stance hand clean with the worst dog. You see a real weightlifter sees you. They're like, just kill yourself, dude. Mm -hmm. There's no point in continuing yeah, on. Yeah. But the one, one rep at one side at a time dumbbell press. And the reason is, um, one is this a needlessly unstable exercise and a lack of stability means a lack of total muscular activation. How do you get the most out of your chest is you set up like a power lifter. You put your fucking feet, corkscrew them into the ground, arch, retract, and then fucking jam with as much force as you can. And the more – you know this. The more mm -hmm. stable you are, the more – you ever see guys set up on a bench and they're doing this? You're like, I guess I'm going to miss that lift. Mm -hmm. um, one of the difficulties of equipped lifting – is because the bubble of the shirt destabilizes you. The best guys in the world at equip lifting have some kind of God-given ability to just fucking just stabilize. How's he doing that? Because you know you miss the bubble and it yeah. goes bloop. Yeah. <laughs> it goes bloop. Yeah. So it's already a known thing that stability is essential to getting the most out of lifting, strength and hypertrophy. And when you're doing this one dumbbell at a time shit, motherfucker, you ain't that stable. What are you doing? You're needless. Like, go do that. At least do that one arm at a time shit inside of like a hammer strength press. But then if you do the one arm at a time shit, someone has to ask like, why? And at least in a hammer strength, you put yourself in the bottom handle here to, to stabilize. You do one arm at a time. There's that whole like when you do one arm at a time, you get a little bit more total yeah. activity thing. It's overrated, but it is a thing. Fine. Defensible. But with a dumbbell, it's if you're locked out and you're doing this, you're just getting tired. So when it's time to switch and do this, you knocked off like three of your best reps just because you're tired. If I told you, hey, we're going to squat for hypertrophy and you're like, dope. And I said, hey, but here's the thing. You're going to walk the weight out. You're going to hold it in the rack position, unrack position for one minute. And then you start doing your reps. You're going to be like, dude, you're a fucking idiot. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get like two. I could have gotten 10. So that fucking one uh, arm at a time shit, yeah. that's my analysis of it. Could I be wrong? Yeah, probably. But that's my shit. All right. So we'll stay on the pressing day, right? So if we go bro split, chest, shoulder, tricep, back. Beautiful. Back, so Beautiful. The bro split shoulder, I also yeah, hate. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> shoulders. So, so the, the more shoulder movement. The um, This is very common. The partial range of motion, seated dumbbell shoulder press. How would you define that being, oh, just so not completing? Just like how normal dudes do it in the gym. Like, oh, you just mean trend like, trend guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just like, uh, yeah, just uh, early. He has to get three guys to fucking put it up for him. Yeah, just two old fellas. Yeah. I touched the 150s today. Like, what does it mean, touched? And then you're like, oh, you actually didn't do a single repetition. I understand why you said touched. It's like a secret wisdom there. Mm -hmm. Why do I think it's a shitty shoulder exercise? Your front delts get so much goddamn work from every press and fly that you do, you just straight up don't ever need to train them by themselves in most cases. Your rear delts, believe it or not, get a fuckload of work from proper back training. So you probably don't need to train them by themselves in most cases. Your side delts get trained where? Nowhere. Pushing, pulling, they don't really do much. The vast majority of your shoulder training should thus be side delt training. Also, your side delts, they get you that. I don't have them. So they give you that cap. That's the look that you want. A guy with big shoulders has big fucking side delts. If a guy has big front delts and big rear delts, but he doesn't have big side delts, no one's going to ever think he has big shoulders because he fucking doesn't. Well, maybe if you did the seated shoulder press, of the, you would have the side delts. Oh, oh, oh. You got to grunt. <laughs> or one arm, too. Oh, that's real extra credit. <laughs> and so that movement, the partial range obviously fucking sucks dick. Um, the instability of dumbbells, like guys will do like sets of six on a dumbbell press. Like motherfucker, you could have gotten way more muscle activity putting yourself in a Smith machine or a regular barbell press because the stability is so big at that point. Like, you know, like you, you fucking pick up the 160s. It's just, it's a circus move at that point. You just got to try to stabilize the shit. There's no way you're getting maximum muscle activity. You spend so much of your cognitive and kind of, uh, not even cognitive, your sort of intrinsic bandwidth in your brain to just, just try Try to stabilize them because it's so fucking goddamn heavy. So that's a mistake already. So anything dumbbell plus really heavy dumbbell for anything less than eight reps is already like suspect. But to put the cherry on top, you're really just training your front delts at that point. 
You're taking massive amount of fatigue. I mean, just the fucking knocking them up there takes a shitload of fatigue. Knocking them back down. Picking heavy ass dumbbells off the fucking rack is already fucking annoying. You're doing all that bullshit to train the front delt. And most guys, it's just total ego. Like, I want to be able to fucking handle the hundreds. So I do it first in my workout. Is it really true to say? Which is actually something I learned from you. You wrote an article back in the day that was fucking brilliant because I usually don't fucking gas up the host this much. You know, I did give you a blowjob earlier off camera. That felt good too. How, how, how do I earn my spot well, on your show? It would have been nice if you finished, but anyhow, we can take care of that later. Uh, trying <laughs> is really all there is to it. And sometimes you <laughs> fail, Dave. You fly too close to the sun. Or in, in this case, you're cock. <laughs> so uh, you said something super fucking wise. It was. Something to the effect of, you really only have two exercises in a session on which you can do fucking hard. Mm -hmm. The rest of it better be fucking just support work. Mm -hmm. Like, and I think you're like, you can squat, you can do good mornings after, heavy, hard, whatever you do after that. Don't kid yourself. Like, it's hypertrophy work, support work, whatever. Yeah. So guys would be like, man, I need fucking bigger delts, and they don't know that they mean side delts, but they mean side delts, and the bodybuilding judges sure shit mean side delts. What do they do first? Fucking dumbbell press for the front delt, even though it's still sore from pack training a day ago, whatever. Nobody asked, nobody answered. And then it's like just fucking just dumb fuckery all the way around. And then they'll do what I'll do after. They'll do seated dumbbell one arm at a time, which is my next exercise that also sucks dick. Seated one dumbbell at a time fucking contralateral bullshit in the fucking, again, front delt. And then a nice full range of motion or a bottom end partials lateral raise. And eh, they'll do that when they're like third. And to your point in that article, like, man, you're not really there all that for the, yeah, mm-hmm. you're doing it, but it's not your best effort. And if you really want to bring up shoulders, you do the side delt first. And in my opinion, nine times out of 10, that's the only fucking delt head you do. You do like four sets of laterals, four sets of some kind of upright row, and you're fucking golden. Great shoulder workout. And you'll see it too. It'll pump up like crazy. If you do that dumbbell press bullshit first and then a stupid fucking one arm at a time front raise. Yeah. Yeah, it gets the fucking TikToker bikini bitches looking at you because you're all trend out of your mind and you're using the 120s. But good hypertrophy to actually make your physique look better, that's just not on the checklist. Triceps. This is a me personally thing. Am I allowed to use a me personally sure, thing? Sure, of course. Um, one arm at a time cable tricep kickbacks because in ho- holding the cable. <laughs> like people do that, bro. And I'm like, there's no way you can produce as much force as if I turn your hand this way and you push down on a fucking bar with both of your goddamn hands. But I guess that should have been second. First on biomechanical grounds is the leaned over tricep dumbbell kickback mm-hmm. because it, um, the best hypertrophy tends to occur on average from lifts that are ultra difficult at the stretch and easier at the contraction, easier at the peak. The tricep, kick, uh, the tricep kickback completely reverses that. It's zero gravity yeah. here and the hardest thing you'll ever do at the top. I did them for a few weeks when I was a kid and I was like, my elbows hurt and nothing else happened. And you get pumped and you get sore, nothing. And then I did a proper skull crusher and I was like, oh my fucking God, my triceps are going to blow off my fucking body. So yeah, the kickback is like one of those exercises is like, thank God, very few people do them now. Bikini girls still do them, but- do they really train? Just kidding, bikini girls. Mm-hmm. JK ladies, LOL. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is it? <laughs> Slay queen. <laughs> but uh, mo- most people don't do them anymore. And f- I thank fucking God, good riddance. Back. Rack pulls. If you want to be a real grown man with chest hair and barbell rows Dorian Yates style aren't manly enough for you, you do. Starting light, controlled, working up, extreme deficit deadlifts, where your back is rounded at the beginning and arched at the top. Put a fucking six-inch box down, take a wide grip, bend your fucking back, and pick up some fucking weight. And if you can do three, four, or five plates with that for sets of five to ten, you will have spinal erectors and rhomboids that, and traps that confuse people. The doctor's like, I think this is like 18 tumors on your back, but they're all on your spinal erectors. That is a gnarly manhood exercise. That's some shit an Icelandic dude would watch you and be like, yes, this is very good. <laughs> uh, rack deadlifts are for two types of people. People that seem to find that that exercise works really well for them and stark raving idiots 
egotistical assholes that just want to lift eight plates for no goddamn good reason. If you want to put as much axial fatigue into yourself with doing as little hypertrophic yield as possible, rack pulls are a great choice. When I say axial fatigue, I bet you know intuitively what I mean. Back in the fucking... Uh, the glory days, Dave, when you were fucking unracking a thousand every other week in the fucking squad and 600 of the good morning, you know, that fatigue of like you later that day after the workout, you reach down for a jug of milk on the bottom shelf and you're like, oh. mm -hmm. like, I swear to God, I think I can't deadlift two plates at this point. That kind of fatigue will fuck up a week's worth of workouts that you plan on doing in higher frequency training. And as a bodybuilder, I mean, you got to show up every day and do that shit. So if you do rack deadlifts in most cases- extreme partial deadlifts, it compresses your spine, which is dope. It'll, it'll turn you into a man, but they can make a little bit. And you don't even get a huge range of motion out of it. You want a real range of motion exercise. It's a fucking hardcore movement. Six inch deficit deadlifts off a fucking box will fuck you up. And it, <laughs> I'm joking, by the way, when I say this, fuck transgender surgery. You want a, you want to fucking go trans? You start as a woman and you do enough of those, you will be a man shortly thereafter. <laughs> Five sets later, you're like, holy shit, I did it. <laughs> you're like, hormones and surgery. You're like, nope, just fucking deadlifts. Deficit deadlifts are hell. Uh, to paraphrase something that I think Ed Cohen said, he's like, you know, after people retire from powerlifting, competition, most guys bench. A lot of guys even squat. Nobody deadlifts anymore. Because mm -hmm. a deadlift is like a fucking, you know what I'm saying? They have like the deadlift is like, fuck. Mm -hmm. And the worst kind of deadlift that also grows your back the most is the deficit deadlift. It stretches your spinal erectors in the most extreme range of motion. And it's minimal axial fatigue because it's only three plates in your hands instead of fucking six. But your back will thank you for it. It'll bulletproof you against injury. But why doesn't anyone want to do it? Because holy shit, is it the hardest goddamn lift in the gym? Can you name a lift in the gym? Strong men have harder lifts that's harder on your whole fucking body and soul than a real deep deficit deadlift. Wait for it for sets of 10 to 12. No. <laughs> You're like what? what, what? No, no I, I mean I was I was running like a suspended good morning. Yes, I, that was running also through there sucks. because of that axle. Also fatigue, great for your back, you know, because of that fatigue. But when you throw that caveat in there, no, yeah, no, yeah, and it's like that exercise isn't even amazing for your back because the stimulus to fatigue ratio for most people is kind of not great because it'll still fuck you up. But at least the stimulus is unbelievable. And for many people, it is the right answer. If you need, you know, some guys have like a wide back, but they don't have a thick back, deficit deadlifts off a six inch platform. And if you're a fucking long arm motherfucker, snatch grip style, just put mm -hmm. them out there. You're not going to like me. If you try this, you're like, your girl's like, Hey, how are you doing in the gym? You're like, Dr. Mike sucks. Cancel my YouTube subscription. Yeah. yeah. But it's real. And so like rack deadlifts and stuff are the opposite of that. It's like you're trying to you're trying to figure out how to lift the most weight to do the least good possible for your body. Biceps. <sighs> On technical grounds, the spider curl, do you know what that is? You're, reverse preacher curl yeah yeah you like bent over a bench and you do yeah, this yeah. because it misses the stretch entirely and it's hard on the peak contraction so it kind of fucking sucks dick um on spirit grounds i just don't understand why people do alternating curls it like takes twice the time i think they're just like looking at their own biceps or some shit like that i never could figure that out it's great for like a flex magazine cover you know where like phil heath is like yeah and he's looking at his arm and he's like, oh cool mm -hmm. that that's dope i love it but as far as like wasting my fucking time fuck that uh so those are probably my answers from no, that's right offhand that's no that's Dumbbell thing cracks me up because anytime I do that, uh -huh. I may start, uh -huh. you know, the first couple of reps uh -huh. that way. Then I'm like, fuck <laughs> this. Fuck that. This I can do this stupid. at the same time. This yeah. is so stupid. Yeah. Um, the, that's another reason why I hate the dumbbell row. Right? Yeah. Because it's just, it's eight sets. Yeah. It's not four. Yes. It's like in there. One, one arm dumbbell row. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I, Dude, absolutely. Yeah. I call them bodybuilding burpees because mm -hmm. you're in a bent over position. You can't breathe. Yep. You know, and then, then you yeah. hop skip one side of the bench to the other. It literally doubles the length of whatever part of the back workout that was. Anything like I'm pretty biased, just just personally, not on technical grounds. Technical grounds, one arm at a time is actually quite good. Mm -hmm. If you want to be in the gym for that long, and look, like you and I spent our entire lives in the gym. I love the fucking place. But like on sheer like like, nah, man. Yeah. Just God damn it. Let's just get this done, bro. <laughs> yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Like, yeah. fuck. It's like if someone's like, hey, like, can you take me to Taco Bell after I've been drinking? You're like, sure. And you like drive around the block twice and then go. They're like, what the fuck was that? And you're like, well, I don't know. I just like driving. They're like, 
yeah, why did this take me to Taco Bell? God damn it. Why did we do that uselessly? So anytime I'm with you on that 100%, mm-hmm. anytime like uh, someone's like, why don't you do one arm rows? I'm like, I used to do them all the time. I'm like, why don't you do them now? I'm like, I just do barbell mat rows and I get the 95% of the benefit in one half of the time. Mm-hmm. That would bring us to quads. Chest, shoulders, like quads. Um, okay, exercises that people actually do. <laughs> that trim for, way down. for bodybuilding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Quad exercises that I hate. I mean, there's a lot of answers to give. Um, I've seen people do one leg at a time, top end leg extensions, no deep stretch, but they do one leg at a time for some reason. I mean, that's just like a preposterous waste of time. Mm-hmm. I'm like, come here, you dumb motherfucker. I'm going to show you how to do a full range of motion hack squad. On the elite hack squat machine, mm-hmm. by the way, we just used earlier. It was fucking amazing. Two sets in and 80 minutes of your workout that you don't have to do, you will be begging for your life and your quads will be sore for three fucking days. I don't even know if your quads can get sore from a fucking top end, one leg at a time, leg extension. I just, I think some guys just like to be at the gym, man, or they're just avoiding the work and just kind of around uh, tons of redundancy. So that I've seen people really do that. I just want to be like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Um, another one is like um, all the plates at the gym, top three inch leg press with your hands pressing on your knees, which is also not safe anymore because you actually can dislocate your knees doing that. There mm-hmm. is now enough force. Hack squats, leg presses, squats, you lock out your knees. People are like, oh, isn't that bad for you? No, you're going to be totally fine. Uh, you know, like it's like, a, you know, getting getting tackled in football. You're probably going to be fine. When you get tackled by a car, you're probably not going to be fine. Mm-hmm. When you have the weight of a fucking American midsize sedan on the leg press and you're pushing on your knees and it's all close to lockout anyway, then fuck that. In most of the leg press video accidents that you see on the internet, that's what people are doing. I did a similar thing back in the day. I just I forgot who I told the story to recently, but uh, when I was 19 years old, I did a uh, squat to pins for a set of, I think, nine with 685 pounds. And my true squat 1RM to depth was probably 405 at the time. And you know, it was at University of Michigan at the Recreation Center gym. And you know, you do something like that in front of a bunch of like teenagers and early 20s people. I remember the entire gym was dead silent. Every rep that I screamed, everyone was like, because you know, like someone mm-hmm. puts seven plates on a bar at a gym in college, everyone's like, what the fuck? And most of those guys probably thought, like, dude, that guy's the fucking man. And I sure should have thought that. I was like, that was great. And I went home and I was like, I felt accomplished. And for the first and only time in my life, I woke up the next day, I was preparing for quad to lay down some muscle soreness. I was like, oh man, my quads are going to be toast. Dave, my knees hurt. And only my knees hurt. And that lesson was lifelong. I was like, yeah, never again. And then like a little while later, I saw an Olympic weightlifter train for the first time, also in that gym. And he kept going down in his squat past the point of like, why? And he just sunk it. And then he sat there with like 225 and just did like sets of 10. And I was like, and his quads were just bulging off of his fucking ass. And I was like, Okay, that's it. That's what I want to do. So that like really partial range top end bullshit, people do it all the time. And it is one trillion percent for the ego and for nothing else. Mm -hmm. Which brings us to hamstrings. I'm gonna I'm gonna get a lot of shit for this one, man. Good. Uh, we'll clip it. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Hamstrings just like I just don't have an answer. Like, oh Mike started (laughs) coughing and we had to end the interview. Um the um what the fuck is that called? The reverse glued ham bullshit. Of, you have one of them. The inverse leg curl? The the Louis Simmons shit, the Mike yeah. Yesis shit. What yeah. the fuck is that called? Oh, the glued There's, ham? Yeah, the glued yeah, ham. Yeah. Um, was never really intended to be a hamstring exercise. It was intended to be an exercise that promotes mobility, general fitness of the posterior chain, and honestly, to unload from all that crazy axial loading fucking equipped guys were doing. Because nobody else really uses that exercise. Um, uh, reverse hypers. Uh, that's another term mm-hmm. for it. Yeah. No one really uses that exercise in equipped lifting for like getting super strong hamstrings or something like that. They do it because after you squat 1100 equipped for three mm-hmm. sets of two, that shit feels better than fucking any massage you could ever get because it pulls your shit apart. Yeah. And it's magic. And as far as like, uh, kind of a like, and it's really good actually for strengthening the spinal erectors in the lower back, but in a really stretched position, it's just awesome therapy. It is a, an amazing exercise for equipped powerlifters, a very good exercise for unequipped powerlifters for that purpose. But I see guys trying to put hamstring size on with it, and I'm like, so first of all, the force curve is all wrong because this is zero weight at the bottom, tons of weight at the top. It's just backwards. 
Um, the other exercise I don't like, which is similar, is a regular 45 degree back raise, but not the 45 one, the parallel one. Mm -hmm. So the guy's lying here and he does this. Yeah. Uh, it's like maximum tension at the top, nothing at the bottom. You can do 10 sets of that and not feel a fucking thing. Whereas if you just walked up to a Smith machine bar, set it at your hips, and bent over the Smith machine bar like that with 20 pound dumbbells and did three sets, you'll be sore the rest of your life. So that to me is like people do exercises. It's kind of a unifying concept for a lot of these. They do exercises nominally. Like they have the notion that this trains this and they never like check with their body. Like, am I getting a pump? Am I feeling tension in the target muscle? Do I feel a burn at higher reps? Am I getting sore from this? Have I progressed visibly in hamstring size? Tough to tell, but over months you can. Or have I at least gotten stronger in other hamstring exercises from this one? Some guys just don't do that. They're just like, chest, I pick an exercise, I do it. Just fucking do it, brother. And you're like, okay, great. But they kind of stay in touch with your body and try to figure out what's going on. You do that enough, you're going to just rule out some exercises as like, this is fucking dumb as rocks. And other exercises, you're going to be like, okay, this is my jam. So the uh, the reverse hyper for me is like just miscategorized by people yeah. as a movement for hamstring hypertrophy. And it's just really not a good movement for that. It's um, I would call that that low end you mm -hmm. know, movement, mm -hmm. you know, like the last thing that you do. Exactly. You know, type of and movement. it feels amazing to do last because you've compressed the living dog shit out of your spine doing 600 pound good mornings, 1100 pound squats. And you go do that and you're like, oh my God, you can get into your car and drive home. Because if you don't do that, you're getting in your car and your adductor cramps mm -hmm. and then your spinal erector cramps. And you're like, help, help. The mm -hmm. cops have to pry your door open and shit. <laughs> so the glutes. <sighs> Man. Which is weird, right? Because yeah. that just, it's, 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 it's always been a body part, yes. but it wasn't. A muscle group. A muscle for people. group. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, now it sure. is. For sure. I'd have to say there are many candidates for this. My personal pet peeve is, and this is done almost exclusively by, by bikini girls, is you go onto an assisted dip machine, assisted dip slash pull up, and you put your front foot on it and you press it down. Mm -hmm. And like, bitch, first of all, that's a one legged squat to a box, which you could have done to a box. Second of all, can you not do? Bodyweight squats, the fuck is wrong with you? And if you've ever done any kind of walking lunge or front foot elevated reverse lunge, it just shatters that. On just perception alone, like you do one set of front foot elevated Smith machine lunge and you're like, I think my glutes are broken. Like, mm -hmm. perfect. Get out of here. Next week, we'll do two sets. You can do that fucking, uh, what's the shit? The fucking dip machine assisted glute. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, like yeah, just I know push what you're it down. About, yeah. And all, you know, aren't you kind of like, limited on how much weight you could actually you use? You would to? think. <laughs> how is it like, how are you so, you, are you? like taking versa grips and tying them into the handles <laughs> so that it's really like a deadlift with one like you have to go out of it's out of going out of your way to do something and this is unfortunately a, a problem in bikini training there's a lot of bikini training that was described purely as visually cosmetic and not in the sense that it's altering how you look it just looks like you're training but you're really just moving around some bikini girls die on the fucking gym floor they train harder than any fucking man i've ever met some bikini girls they look like they're training but they're not training and one of the biggest problems is the reps in reserve, the proximity to failure is like approximately infinity. If I saw a bikini girl do that like one leg dip push down machine, a thing until she was like shaking and like barely able to lock it out, I'd be like, like that's not a great exercise, but like, total respect. What do they do, bro? They do 12, a set of 12. Ooh, that burns. Check their phone. Set of 12 on the other leg. Check their phone. Four sets of 12 and 30 fucking minutes later, nothing happened to your body. You're just moving around. My grandma can do that exercise. She's been dead for 18 fucking years. <laughs> you just put her on the dip machine and boom, that's it. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm kidding. All right. So let's go back to the- Did you the, skip calves? Uh, yes, I did. Calves. How, how yeah, dare calves. you? are like, I don't care. Well, there's, frankly. Like, there's like three <laughs> movements, <laughs> right? <laughs> the worst exercise is skipping calves, yeah, I think I, Well, I think I skipped that one because I don't know how I would answer it. <laughs> right. Right? Because you got seated, you got standing, you got I, stair calves. I, I, okay. So I actually do have an answer for this. Yeah. It is uh, with a very short range of motion, the seated calf machine. So it turns out there's two parts of your calf, uh, the soleus muscle and mm -hmm. the gastroc. The gastroc's the big diamond one you want big. The soleus one is too slow twitch oriented in most cases to get very big. It's the muscle that lets you run endurance races. Because if you, you ever see people with really big calves, try to get them to run two miles. They're going to cramp and it's not going to mm -hmm. happen. But like a nice, well-developed soleus muscle, which isn't even much bigger, it's like 15% bigger. You can run forever on that fucking thing. When you bend the knee, the uh, gastroc muscle, the one that gets big, goes into insufficiency. Like the slack is completely 
pulled into the muscle, not out of the muscle. So it can't possibly generate any kind of tension, meaningful tension, and it can't be put into a stretch. The soleus still can because the soleus doesn't cross the knee. The gastroc does. So when you bend the knee and you go and you do and sitting, I like to call them double dildo raises because you got the double dildo handles mm-hmm. and you do this fucking bullshit. And guys will load like eight plates on each side and be like, yeah, yeah. And they get nothing out of it. They don't get sore. They don't get pumped. They don't get tired. And they think their calves are growing, but always they have fucking small calves. So good exercise for calves are when they get a deep, gnarly stretch. Like just take a dumbbell and go on a staircase, hold the railing and just fucking feet halfway on the fucking staircase and go super, super deep, hold for two seconds at the bottom, pump up halfway and do that again. It's going to fucking ruin your life in the best possible way. But that seated fucking calf shit, man, I just like, if I see a gym that has a seated calf machine, I'm like, someone here ordered the wrong machine. I would, if I took over that gym, uh, that, that gym, like as like uh, the manager, I would just straight up, my first thing would be to just throw it away or give it to charity. And it's not even good to give to charity because you're giving those kids no, no goddamn cho- chance in life. You know, they could be a, someone with yeah. big calves, but now they're just going to be a fucking guy who wastes their time <laughs> doing eight plates on a nonsense machine. So with you said earlier, the bro split, you know, the upper, lower, whatever split mm-hmm. that's called. Mm-hmm. Um, why? Why do you despise that? Yeah. Because in my experience, well, let's define it first because it's some bro splits are just one body part each week. I don't like the one body part each week. Okay. So that's what we're talking about. Correct. Okay. Because I don't know of anyone whose biceps take as long to heal as their quads and neither do you. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's one out of a hundred dudes. Fine. Maybe one out of a thousand. Maybe. <laughs> right. And so to me, it's like if you have a really good proper quad workout, you might need a week. Probably you can train quads twice a week if you intelligently program and you do slightly lower volume each session. But I got no love lost for people to train quads, back, hamstrings, glutes, and maybe even chest once a week. Dope. I love it. Side delts, biceps, calves, forearms. Man, you can train those two, three times a week, no problem. And so here's another concern. People have like a back day, dope. Back takes a fucking day to train. Leg day. It definitely takes a day to train. And Mm -hmm. if you break up quads and hams, even that makes sense. How the fuck are you going to have a shoulder day? You drive to the gym to train your fucking shoulders? That's a 30-minute workout if you're doing it right. Of course, they don't. So they're there for an Mm -hmm. hour doing goddamn nothing. And can arms take a whole session? Yeah. But in many cases, some guys split up biceps and triceps in a bro split. So they'll have like a bicep day and a tricep day. And you're like, do you have a day for biceps and a day for triceps? Are you fucking crazy? And so your workout's like one, if one workout is 20 minutes and the other workout's an hour and a half, respect. But also like you can consolidate your workouts so that you have five days a week of training instead of six, maybe even four. And you get a lot of downtime and really good rest time. Because as you well know, when you train really hard, but not every goddamn day of your life, you recover so well on your off days that you come back that next week like a fucking fright train. But if you train every day, some bullshit like that, you may find that your motivation to go to the gym declines. So my, those are the two real big problems I have with the bro split is a lot of muscles need to be trained multiple times a week, even if you're fucking jacked and gigantic. And also, you just due diligence means you got to split up some parts of the body and other parts of the body do not need to be split up. You know, they need to be condensed together. All right. Now with and training in general, we have the the big rocks, right? Which how you program your training, nutrition, recovery, all the things that are there. And we've discussed that before. You discuss it on your channels, discussed all the time. Then there's things on the margin, mm-hmm. right? Those things are what some people will cherry pick to put out there and create a whole program around. Sure. Right. But there's still validity in those things that are around the margins. Mm -hmm. If the margin is 10% or whatever Mm -hmm. little, Mm -hmm. it's not the majority, you know, so I want to make that definitely clear for everybody. It's not even close to the majority. Sure. But there still is this area around the margins, which would lead things like, um, uh, nutrient timing. Yes. Um, well, let's go there first because sure. there's a bunch of other ones. So assuming that the protein intake is what it should be, you know, the nutrition is mm-hmm. what it should be, all those bases mm-hmm. are covered, mm-hmm. then how's that work on the margins to be able to optimize? Yeah. So like uh, from the nutritional perspective. Yeah. So nutrient timing is like um, four or more protein feedings roughly spread throughout the day. And the gain you get between four and five and five and six and six and seven 
is somewhere between insanely marginal and purely theoretical to like actually theory says you won't get any gains and some theory would say you get even less. So four to six high protein meals per day, roughly spread evenly, is fucking dope. Can you get really good gains off of three meals a day? Yeah, sure. Grandpa did it. Dad did it. Four to five is probably better. Another one is where you put your carbohydrates, especially if you're the kind of person that when they have carbs, they get a lot of energy. And especially if you're training in such a way that's really hard and you need a lot of recovery. If you're in that group of people, it's probably good to have some carbs in the meal that precedes your workout a couple hours before. It's probably good to have carbs and protein right after your workout. It would be curious to have a vastly disproportionate amount of your carbs way outside the workout window. And then like the meal before your workout, no carbs. The meal after your workout, also no carbs, and then you go to sleep. That would be fucking stupid. Is it going to change your life completely? No, fuck no. You make good gains anyway if you get 400 grams of carbs a day, whatever. But the timing does matter on the margins. So the concern there is like pre-workout, post-workout, especially post-workout and the meal after that, a disproportionately high percent by some margin of your carbs should be there. And a better way to phrase it is probably like, you should have some fucking carbs pre and post workout in most cases, especially post workout in my opinion. But if you get a lot of energy from some guys, like will eat a bowl of white rice and they just like fucking turn on fire. They're like, I can't fucking wait to train. Yeah. You need that fucking bowl of rice. And if some nutrition coach takes it away from you, they had, they had better have a goddamn good reason. Mm -hmm. What about supplements? Assuming that the supplements are what they are supposed to be, yeah, which is the whole other conversation. Yeah. So creatine works. Creatine mm -hmm. monohydrate, all the other creatines are either have no support for them and have or have like literally evidence against them. Um, so that's uh, definitely a thing. Whey protein works really well around the workout window or as a part of a meal replacement shake. There's nothing magical about it. And if you're eating enough protein throughout the day anyway, as a scientist, even though I do like whey protein myself, uh, as a scientist, I have to recognize that the empirical literature has not been kind to supplemental protein in the context of an already high protein diet. The way you get a lot of studies to support that protein shakes are good is you feed people like a regular human amount of protein, like whatever, like you know, like read the nutrition facts on a chicken breast, like percent daily value of protein is like 80%. You're like, what the fuck? That's one mm -hmm. chicken breast. So if you got people eating one chicken breast a day, a whey protein shake at night will revolutionize your gains. And that's how most of the literature was built up to be like, whey protein's great. But if they're already eating 200 grams of protein a day and they weigh 200 pounds, uh, whey protein, in addition to that, has like a very contextual, very nuanced, very tiny, if any, benefit at all. Carbohydrate shakes can be cool around the workout window, mostly because it gets good to have carbs during and post-workout for long workouts. Helps you recover better. Helps you have energy towards the end of the workout. But like that's why Gatorade powder is dope. But it's really a food. It's a, it is mm -hmm. a supplement in the technical sense. But um, you know, are we really calling Gatorade a supplement? We can, and I do, and I think it's validity there. But I got to recognize that like. Yeah, it's not like a pill you can take and it does really great things for you. Outside of like, you know, casein protein is also great, but you can get it from like frozen like uh like yogurt and stuff. Like Greek yogurt has most mostly casein, milk is mostly casein. So is a casein protein like cool before you go to bed or some shit, or like a long stretch where you can't eat protein? Yeah, sure. Is a multivitamin and maybe even a greens powder in some context a good idea? Yeah, sure. Are these make or break if you have a healthy balanced diet already? No, fuck no. You'll never even notice that they're there. So in general, outside of those supplements and, uh, you know, if you need it slash want it, a pre-workout with plenty of stimulants, the conversation for what supplements are left that are truly robustly effective and worth your money if you're not a trillionaire like me. Also, I just want to make an announcement. I, re I recently, my overall valuation passed, I think, $3 trillion, and I'm quite happy about that. <laughs> I, I bought a skyscraper to celebrate, mm -hmm. and I had it summarily demolished. Just for shits and giggles. <laughs> what is $10 billion between friends? Mm -hmm. If you're not a trillionaire, then uh, it matters that you're spending a fuckload of money on shit you think you're getting a lot out of it. And outside of those supplements that I just listed, the most effective one of which is creatine, and if you need it, stimulant-based pre-workouts, outside of those, uh, the conversation for supplements turns much more from performance and uh, much more into health on a context-dependent basis. So for example... Some people who live in places like Ohio and Michigan that suck and have no sunlight, um, a, D, a D vitamin supplement is a really good idea. But not everyone needs one. And you can get tests to see if you're deficient, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Because if you're deficient in D vitamins, you start taking them. Holy shit, it changes your fucking world. If you're not deficient, you start taking them and you're just like literally flushing money down the fucking toilet. 
So there are some other context dependent supplements we can discuss, but generally on average for just general advice like this on this podcast, mm-hmm. that's really about the whole list of supplements. I might be missing one or two here and there, but I promise you I'm not missing much. Mm-hmm. And so does that kind of fuck the supplement industry in the ass a little bit? Maybe, but I like the supplement industry. I think some of the whey protein products and the casein and the RTDs like PS, fair life. We exist <laughs> and have a popular YouTube channel. I'd love to shill for you, but mm-hmm. uh, they're too big to know that we are either like, it's like I'm a tiny little dude in Japan and they're like Godzilla, like, I mm-hmm. own my Coca Cola. So they, mm-hmm. they don't even see us, right? Um, but, you know, protein shakes and bars are fucking dope, but they're just another way of getting food. It's just differently processed food. And so is there really any one pill that I can take that's going to make me fucking awesome? Yeah, it's called Anadrol mm-hmm. and it doesn't make you awesome, just bloated, but jacked. So, that's kind of the story on supplements, man, is that like, yeah, supplements work and they're fucking dope, but they work a little bit and it's contextual and most of it's just food repackaged. And I love it. I think the supplement industry is great. Most of it's great, but some part of the supplement industry is good. people like, you know, fly by night companies that are going to have you convinced that like, yeah, take terchesterone and it's going to blow you up. Like we have enough research now to say that's probably not going to do diddly dick. And it just so happens that most of the people that sell terchesterone is, is not even terchesterone in it. It's totally fake. Mm-hmm. So... If you're looking for pills you can take that really enhance your shit, and that's what you think about supplements, you're looking at a whole lot of nothing. And yes, I think it was yesterday or the day before yesterday, I listened to the conversation that you had with Eric about the supplement. Eric he Helms. Said, Dr. Eric, Eric Helms. Helms. Yes, Dr. yes. Dr. That was Helms. fascinating. I was yes. fucking shocked. I was yes. like, oh shit, I'm glad I'm not getting drug tested. Why is I, am I the only one that's watching that thinking like, why didn't I know? That all this extra shit was yeah. in these things because I would have bought the hell out of it. Dude. So a little different perspective. I don't know, but here's the problem. I don't know if you got to this part of the interview, but I, I don't even know if I, I asked him off camera uh, for sure earlier when he was telling me about it. I might not have asked him on camera. The doses of gear is just from like impurities and it's not enough to move the needle, bro. You'll take like four scoops of the whey protein that has D ball in it, and you'll get like two grams of D ball. What mm-hmm. a fucking oh, grams, Jesus, milligrams. <laughs> two grams of D ball will get you going. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like, you know, for context, people that don't know, like the conversation on D ball for males starts at five to 10 milligrams and scales up from there. And if you've been to West Side, it starts at mm-hmm. 100 milligrams and scales up from there, right? But um, it, it, that's the, the, the really shitty part is that like, in some pre-workouts, in some testosterone booster formulas, in some like fat loss formulas, there's real gnarly drugs in there at pharmacologically effective doses. The problem with contamination is that there's a lot of shit in the whey proteins and all these other drinks and potions and powders, in your creatines. There's just enough gear to get you popped in a drug test, but not, not enough any, to get you jacked. It's sucks. literally the worst possible thing. If I got popped as a fucking Olympic athlete, my God, then no one would stop me. I'd walk into that headquarters and- I would actually really take drugs to be like fucking Bane and walk in there mm-hmm. and be like, I took your supplements. Look what you made. Uh. But yeah, no, that, that really sucked. That, that conversation is available on the RP Strength YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's like basically, are your supplements contaminated? Maybe. And look, the, actually, the vast majority of supplements are not contaminated. But by that, I mean like 80%. Because like 20% of commercially available supplements will get your ass popped in a water grade drug test. This is bad news, man. Mm-hmm. A lot of high school kids trying to go pro, go to college football or taking the supplements and they get a test in college football and be like, you're on drugs. And they're like, uh, uh, I am. <laughs> and it didn't even help. No. That's At least if it helps. Hey, all right, fine. Yeah. Yeah. Staying on the margins, if we're talking about what I would call intensification methods in training. Sure, sure. Like pre-exhaust. So sure. I'm just going to, we'll just rip through each sure, one sure. of these with your opinion on sure, that. Sure. So pre-exhaust being first. Pre-exhaust is something that can help you more isolate a muscle that really needs work and can turn compound movements done afterwards into movements that really target that muscle. So let's say you're doing high bar squats for quads. Let's say you train in a garage gym. If you just do high bar squats and you happen to be kind of glute dominant, you get really sore glutes, really sore adductors, really tired, and your quads just won't be that hit up. If you do leg extensions after, you can put in some good volume, but you're already kind of tired and your leg extensions like, meh. So quads are getting literally like a second tier treatment. But if you do some leg extensions or some sissy squats or something to really fuck up your quads before you squat, quads are now the limiting factor on your squat. And now every single set that you get near failure, it's near failure because your quads are near failure. And that's where they get their best growth. So pre-exhaustion is excellent for that specific condition. And when you're really, really big and strong bodybuilder, 
and you want to be ultra jacked but don't want to get hurt lifting ultra heavy weights, pre-exhaust is a very awesome strategy. But if you're a 150 pound kid who goes to college and you're doing pre-exhaust for your pecs, you should just be doing like incline and flat mm-hmm. barbell dumbbell pressing and dips and it's going to fuck you up so goddamn bad you just don't need it it's one of those things that people will do even when they don't need and so most good lifting doesn't require pre-exhaust but in some context where you really need to isolate a muscle and make it the limiting factor for later lifts pre-exhaust is dope rest pause mile reps yeah or whatever i mean i love the shit so first of all it saves a crap load of time um the total amount of intensity and volume you put in is really the humongously determining factor for how uh, jacked you're going to get. So if you do 100 total reps for your triceps and uh, most of the sets in which you did them are pretty close to failure, you're going to get almost equivalent growth to any other way you split them up. If it's straight sets, if it's my reps, if it's drop sets, four reps, whatever, it doesn't matter much. But on the margins, it does a little bit. And so some muscles are really hard to get like metabolites sequestered into unless you do it my rep style. Like straight sets work amazingly for plenty of muscles, but for some muscles, especially for some people, you need clusters of sets to really fucking drive that shit in there. Like sets of eight in the barbell bicep curl, it dope, it works. But for some people, they're just like, I don't know, man. Is it getting pumps? Is it getting sore? Is that that tired? Do you sets of eight for quads and they're fucking, they get blown up for biceps sometimes. Tricep, it doesn't really work. But if you do tricep pushdowns, like you do a set of 20 pushdowns, close to failure, and you rest a minute or two, then you aim to do a set of 20. But if you get close to failure, you stop, you breathe for five or 10 seconds, you keep going. And then another set of 20, you now have like seven approaches to failure in three sets of pushdowns that is qualitatively going to feel really, really different and probably grow you more muscle. Could you have grown a similar amount of muscle just doing straight three sets of 20 or some shit? Yeah, sure. But also you save yourself a ton of time doing that and get at least as good of hypertrophy result. And I would argue probably a little bit better. So like, why not do it? Uh, so cluster sets and 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 uh, rest pause and my rep sets can in that context be awesome. The context I wouldn't use them in is if you have cardio, like systemic limitations, nobody fucking Maya reps high bar squats. Yeah. Because yeah. after you do a set of 10, you're just on the ground throwing up. You're not doing like rest five seconds into a set of five. Because you rest five seconds, you would unrack the bar and you'd be like, take it, take it, take it, take it, take it. You would just collapse. But like wrist curls, tricep push downs, push ups, they're great for that shit. How would that be different than from strip sets? What's a strip set? That sounds sexy. Well, when you <laughs> drop sets, drop sets. Yeah, yeah, strip yeah. Sets, same thing. Um, you get to keep the absolute intensity the same. So the load stays heavy. There's a thing where for some people that are more fast twitch dominant, when you start doing drop sets, they quickly get to a weight that's so light that it's just kind of running blood through the muscles, not doing shit. The fast twitch fibers are so fatigued, they don't even activate anymore. So it'd be better if you, instead of resting two seconds, taking the weight off and going, that you rested my rep style five or 10 seconds, you use the same load again. And if you're a little bit more fast twitch uh, oriented, the fast fibers wake up enough to do another three or four reps, and then it's fucking awesome. But we're really, really, really really splitting hairs. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if we're going uh, supersets with, so n- now it's not a rest pause, like, so it, now it's a superset of yeah. opposing or different body parts, pros and cons of that. Totally. Uh, opposing body parts, you save an unbelievable amount of total training time, but there's no net beneficial effect to one of the muscles or the other. In fact, there's probably a net negative effect in most cases by a small margin, because when you just did tricep pushdowns and with no rest, really, you start to do bicep curls, systemically, neurologically, psychologically, you're not going to work as hard on that fucking set of bicep because you're still recovering. And this is something that I think people who are a little bit weaker don't quite con- contextualize. And honestly, for them, it doesn't fucking matter. It's so mm-hmm. good. Mm-hmm. But when you've been pretty strong, the idea that you can give it somewhere remotely near your all when you just have finished another exercise for another muscle group five seconds before is pure, total, unadulterated nonsense. It's just not going to happen. But in some context, it worked really well, and it saves an unbelievable amount of time. I happen to believe, personally, that the vast majority of personal trainers and the vast majority of adults training for what's called adult fitness, just staying in good shape, should be doing uh, compound, mostly compound, alternating supersets with antagonistic or unrelated muscle groups. Set of squats, set of push-ups. Set of squats, set of push-ups. Set of hamstring curls set of pull-ups, set of hamstring curls. You can annihilate your whole fucking body and get an unbelievable cardio workout in like 20 fucking minutes doing that shit. Why doesn't, why don't most people do it? Because it's brutal. Nobody wants to do that shit. It's the hardest fucking thing in the world. That's at CrossFit. 
CrossFit's fucking super effective, but I'm not doing it because it's too fucking hard. Like, what? I have to do what? Fuck that. So it's amazing for regular folks trying to get in shape. Pre-exhaust uh, supersets, where you do a set of tricep pushdowns and a set of dumbbell presses, they're super great and super effective. The best way to do them is probably to choose an exercise as the second exercise that has to have that first muscle be the limiting factor and can't transfer the load and responsibility to other muscles. Here's what I mean by that. If you do, and it's a small detail, but it might as well share mm -hmm. the science or whatever mm -hmm. bullshit. If you do cable tricep pushdowns and then you run over quickly and do incline dumbbell press, close grip, your chest and shoulders cannot possibly do the work of your triceps because what would happen is if your triceps were essentially totally inactive, what would happen? You go, bloop, <laughs> your triceps aren't mm -hmm. extending. Your triceps have to be active in order to contribute to the movement because it's an open chain exercise and there's, there's, there's nothing on the other end. But with closed chain exercises, and I don't like open chain, closed chain is like it's a fucking dumbass concept we need to, uh, we need to throw away. But something like a, uh, if you do push downs and then you go and do a chest press machine, if we chemically deactivated your chemically or neurologically snip the nerve or put a nanobot in the nerve turned off for five minutes to your tricep, you can still press exclusively with your pecs. Because if you think about it, the end point of where you're holding it is completely fixed and fixed on both sides. And as you activate only your chest and shoulders, your elbow gets pushed forward. The locking out part isn't even done by your triceps. It just has to happen. It's like, you know, in an engine, like the torque bar, or whatever mm -hmm. does this, it, 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 if it goes down, the other part has to move. There's nowhere else for it to go. So if you do push downs and you do machine presses, your triceps are tired and your body, unless you're very in touch with your mind muscle connection, which then you can subvert this to a small extent. But, and this is something that uh, Coach Kasim, Kasim Hansen, brought up as a very excellent point in a discussion we had. Your body's really, really good at trying to go into survival mode and just using whatever muscle is available and not tired to do the job. So if you do a shitload of tricep extensions and you're fucked, you go and even with a close grip, you try to do a machine, uh, try, uh, machine chest press or a machine close grip press, your body's like, mm, triceps are done. Fuck that, fellas. Just turn the chest on and then people can tell because if you do some pre-exhaust tricep stuff and then you do a machine press, your chest gets mega pumped. You're like, what the fuck? And your triceps are like, kind of like, yeah, they're sort of pumped. But if you do something like push downs and then dumbbells, your triceps get ultra fucked up and that's by a small margin, the proper way to do mm -hmm. that. Next, next would be tempo changing mm -hmm. within the same set. Ooh, describe that. What do you mean? So if, if you start out with, say, a six-second eccentric and then drop after a few reps to four or vice versa, just like a Paul Quinn used to put a bunch yeah, of yeah, yeah. stuff out there. Um, it's it's kind of cool because it's it can, endless on how you could do it. Sure. It's kind of cool because it can buy you like more reps. It's like progressively um, trying to like take less energy out of yourself on the eccentric so you can get more reps. It's It's nice. So there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with it. And it works great. To me, there's no compelling reason to do it other than variation. And there's at least one reason that I would be a little bit, not skeptical, but kind of standoffish about it. It's complicated. I want to simplify training as much as possible. And this is coming from Mr. Fucking Science Guy, asshole, Jew nerd guy, who's like, technically speaking, MRV is back home, right? All this shit that I fucking talk about. Make training as complex as it has to be, but no more complex. When I'm plugging in for a set of hack squats and I have my tempo down on the eccentric to three seconds, bro, I don't want to think about like when do I turn it up to two, when do I turn it to one? Three seconds all the way through the set. Mm -hmm. And it's just going to be a hard set. And if next month I want to do one second eccentric hack squats, awesome. If you're changing the tempo as the movement progresses, to me, that's kind of like an extra thing you have to keep in cognitive bandwidth. And then you don't think as much about technique and pacing and all this other stuff and positioning and just gritting and fucking screaming at the bar and doing the shit you're supposed to do. By a small margin, you don't do it as much. Well, it would also make it difficult to be able to track if you're progressing or not. Oh, my God. Super difficult. Because you're like, yeah, I did three second eccentrics, but then I think I went to two like a rep early. Maybe it was, I, th I thought it was three seconds, but I kind of rushed it. 100% Dave. 
amazing point. It makes tracking difficult. And tracking in some sense, like a little bit overrated because just train hard and you'll be fine. Agreed. But like if you're taking the shit really, really seriously, you're going to want to track. And exper- especially experimenting with what works better or worse, tracking is the only way to tell you what's what's happening on, the, on a medium time scale. Over the weeks, you can't see your muscles grow. What the fuck up out of here? If you're already pretty advanced, it's just like, I don't know, I think it's growing. So tracking is thus important and tracking is best done, possibly only done uh, in a state of stability, in a state of everything is equal except for this. And if your set looks like weird, like I've seen some guys train where there's an inconsistent range of motion in every single rep, like some pull-ups mm-hmm. are full range, some are partial, some are little pulse reps, and then back to full in the same set. I'm just like, I don't even know what's going on. How the fuck does that person know what's going on? Yeah. So let's double down on this one because that's that can that can there's two camps that will kind of e- emerge from that the ones that will say that you need to stay with the same movement to be able to try to increase a rep or weight you know for whatever that mesocycle is then the other ones are going to say you know bro look the the muscle doesn't know the difference mm-hmm. as long as i'm training it hard every time i train it then it's it doesn't matter if i change the movement every single time mm-hmm. where I understand where both those camps kind of come from, but to your point, which I want you to elaborate on a little bit more, how do you know that you're Mm -hmm. actually progressing? Because if you're changing your your chest movements every single time you come in, which a lot of people do, right? And then how do you know? Sure. You actually can find out if you're progressing like that because eight weeks later, when you come back to the workout you did eight weeks ago, it's finally the same movements and shit like that. If you outperform your reps and, and load, then you progressed. So you can track that. Mm -hmm. There's a different problem there. When you, let's say you haven't done hack squats in a while. You throw hack squats randomly in. The first workout you do with hack squats, it's going to go well. You're going to get sore. It's going to be really effective. Awesome. But a lot of your biggest motor units, the motor nerve, the neuron that uh, penetrates from your spine all the way into the muscle and the parts of the muscle, huge, huge fibers, the biggest fibers, they don't really activate a ton because your body saves them for when you're ultra stable and your technique is ultra perfected and you learn how to really push. For example, when you take people and you teach them how to squat properly, they have quite big quads to begin with and their quads don't grow that fast. But you see people's loads doubling on the squat in a few six weeks when they started just because their technical Mm -hmm. ability to, to, to do it. And here's the thing. Technical ability also means you're using all of your muscle now to push. Where before, there's a coordination problem, a little bit of instability. If you do hack squats every five or six weeks because you just randomly get in the rotation, you're never very good at them and you never use them to milk all of the muscle that you could. So what I would say is it a little bit better. Now, obviously, that works great. It works great. Mm -hmm. And the variation is awesome because nothing ever really gets stale, which is cool. But the downside is that you don't ever really groove in. And if you groove into hack squats, the next time you lift even more and even more and even more, and now more and more of your musculature in your quads is getting used and pushed. So what I would say is... At RP, we like to promote the kind of middle ground approach. We think variation is awesome, but we also think you should milk everything you can out of your variants. So you pick a series of movements, you stick to it for one to six months. Beginners can do a movement for two years and get great results. Mm -hmm. One to six months. When you plateau on the movement, when your joints start to hurt more than your muscles, when you're not gaining any more strength on the movement, when it feels stale and you fucking hate doing it, then take it out. It'll happen between one and usually three or four months in, sometimes as long as six. You take that movement out, you replace it with some other movement that's also awesome, and then you ride that wave again. If you replace movements every other day, every other week, then you never milk a true potential out of any of the movements because you're not fucking that good at any of them. It's like a new thing every single time. It's like um, you're, you're trying to write letters to people in different languages, but you're choosing a different language every week. You're not really going to get good at writing in German if you try the shit every week in Italian every other week and English every other week. But if you go for four to eight weeks writing letters in German, um, you're going to get pretty goddamn good at it. And the way the body works and the brain works is that if you achieve a really high level of ability in something, some of that you never lose. If you are really good ever in your life at writing letters in German because you did it for weeks and weeks and weeks on end, a couple weeks later when you come back to it, you're real goddamn good at it again. Whereas if you've only had a few weeks here and there, eight weeks total over the course of your life, but never sequentially that you wrote in German – you're never really going to be that good at German until mm-hmm. you put in the fucking sequential time, which is one of the reasons, who just one, why the best kind of language training you can have is immersive language training. You want to speak Portuguese? Live in Brazil for a year. You'll speak real good Portuguese. But like, you know, like 
doing an app is good, but you're just not consistently practicing and thinking and reading labels at the store and trying to do the checkout with a lady who only speaks Portuguese. The same thing applies to muscles. Soak them fucking shits into a few exercises and get real goddamn good at them. Your hack squat, you might add a plate on a side to your hack squat in eight in eight weeks. Does that mean you got that much muscle? No. But that means by the end of that eight, week, eight weeks, you were getting full muscle activity and recruitment out of that hack squat. You And also, here's the thing. A real world, how this works is like you do the hack squat once. It went well. But you notice like you were moving your feet around set to set. And only in your last set did you find the foot position was pretty fucking good. If you don't do hack squats next week, first of all, you forget where the fuck you put your mm -hmm. feet. And second of all, your body changes over time and maybe your feet don't feel, feel good, even if you wrote it down somehow. But if next week you have hack squats again and you know where you put your feet now, your set is an A effort instead of an A minus effort from set one. The week after that, it's an A plus effort. Five weeks after that, it's a hundred percent effort. It's the best hack squat setup. You know, like you know how to set up for your fucking exercises. Mm -hmm. But if you bench press or squat or deadlifted once every blue moon, you wouldn't know fucking shit. Yeah. Well, even if you do know and you get away for it from yes, it from it a little feels while, feels weird. There's there's like a reacclimation period where I don't even know if those are real gains. They're neural gains. You're sure. kind of remembering how sure. to do it. Sure. And that takes time. Yes. And if you vary your shit every week, you're always in that period. Mm -hmm. If you vary every few months, yeah, first month you're in that period. But the good thing is novelty grows you. Novelty is good. It's, it promotes hypertrophy. But we like to milk the novelty and the expertise. Mm -hmm. If you never change your movements, you get real expert at it, but you never get novelty. If you change your movements every week, you get really good novelty all the time, but you never get that grooved in expertise and that mm -hmm. really milking everything the movement has to offer. So I think you basically do a movement until it fucking sucks and then you dump it. You do another movement. You get really, really good at it. You get really great gains and then it sucks and you go. And that way also, you don't run through all your variants. Like I'll go a year without hack squatting and then I'll go four months with hack squatting. And the next time I hack squat, it's like a new movement all over again in the best possible way. But I also milk those top end gains from it. Whereas if I change movements every week, four weeks later, I might be like, everything's stale. The fuck do I do now? Like you look around the gym, you're like, oh, leg extension kind of sucks, leg press, fuck that. Roger squat's cool, but I don't know. And then you're like, what the fuck am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to introduce variation? It's kind of like this. If you eat every meal, you live in a small town which is how many restaurants a small town has is approximately how many exercises you can realistically do in the gym. If every single week, fuck that, every single day, you eat at a different restaurant in your small town, about three days later, you're going to be like, get me the fuck out of here. Mm -hmm. I've had it all. Well, you can do that as a trillionaire. As a trillionaire, I've actually purchased several yeah, small towns. Yeah, yeah, I like yeah. to have them demolished. Yeah. We give people one day mm -hmm. notice, by the way. I'm not a cruel person. Yeah. Um, and uh, if you live in a small town and you think the shit through and you really like food and you want to keep the experience alive, don't eat at all the restaurants in one day. Mm -hmm. Have a week of where you try some menu items at one. Have another week where you try some menu items at another. Four weeks later, you'll be like, you know what? I'm really craving Chinese food. You'll never say that if you eat Chinese food every second day because there's only eight restaurants. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Same idea with hypertrophy training. I think to me, not the crazy thing, but the... A downside of extremism in many contexts, including training, is people lean to one side or the other. They go, well, is it, is it variation and novelty versus like establishing a real groove and expertise? Both have their advantages. So the middle ground is oftentimes a really good way to do things. Not always, but often. The Something that's interesting to me is you're, you've kind of morphed into this hypertrophy guy, but you're really strength and conditioning sport periodization. Sure. Person. Yes. But, some, someday so, so, I was yeah, long so, ago. So you periodize, you know, your hypertrophy training, yeah. you know, through that. So the, the question I would have is when, as a strength athlete, you have these hypertrophy phases, then you start to move into a strength phase or peak phase. Mm -hmm. Now, how does one go about taking what I would call those bottom exercises, which are basically just kind of there for hypertrophy, blood flow, um, work capacity or mm -hmm. whatever? How do you maintain? Because you're not really going to build a lot of hypertrophy as you go through those phases. I may get slammed for that, but yeah, odds no. are you're really not. That's not the emphasis. If you're doing it right, you're not. Yeah. But at the same time, you don't want to lose mm -hmm. you know, what's been gained mm -hmm. during that time period. Mm -hmm. And what we see with a lot of strength athletes and powerlifters is they peak through those meets. They do begin yeah. to lose a little bit. And some of that's to be 
probably accepted. Yes. You know, but how do you mitigate from that without overreaching yeah, yeah. or creating systemic fatigue? Yeah, I can think of a few ways. One is you can always keep the exercises in, but just modulate their set numbers. When I'm training for hypertrophy, I do four sets of leg press. When I'm training for strength, I do one set of leg press at the end of my workout. Not going to fatigue you a ton, mm -hmm. but sure, sure, going to keep your quads bent. Another thing I would say is that you can do a phase of training called a fitness return. Austere periodization term, no one knows because they didn't go to school for this shit because most people have mm -hmm. better things to do with their goddamn time. You do a deload after before a big meet. Well, fuck. You do a taper, then a deload, mm -hmm. then the meet, then a week off because you're all fucked up. Then you have another meet in six weeks. Two weeks of the, the first two weeks of that six, you could do a bit more kind of hypertrophy work, a bit more volume, get all that muscle back, and it comes back quick, and also do your strength work, but kind of ease into your strength work. And then four weeks out, strength slash peaking again. Two weeks out, only peaking, and then boom, you're right back in the mix. Uh, a lot of people will be like, well, got to meet coming up, and takes me two months to peak for my strength, so it's all strength work and no hypertrophy. Mm, not quite. If you lost some size, you got to get some fucking size back. So that's definitely a consideration. And um, uh, the last thing I say is, if you're doing a sufficient amount of strength work, especially in raw lifting, and you're doing a decent amount of strength volume, you probably should not lose muscle size, at least during your strength phase. During your peaking phase, you might a little mm -hmm. bit, which is why fitness return is so awesome. But a lot of guys will say like, yeah, man, like how do I keep my muscle on? You know, And you look at the program and it's like four sets of uh, five in the bench press, you know, four sets of six and weighted dips. You're like, dude, I, you are not losing muscle. That is plenty of fucking work. Mm -hmm. And this thing happens in physiology where when you're not doing a lot of high volume hypertrophy work, you end up deflating a little bit. You have less intramuscular inflammation and you look smaller, but you're not actually smaller. You lost no muscle cross-sectional area, you lost no muscle size. But you're doing sets of four, sets of three, sets of two. It looks like you lost size because you're not pumped all the goddamn time. You know, like when you have sore quads, they're just fucking pumped. Mm -hmm. like you did quads on Sunday. They're pumped on fucking Wednesday. So guys will be like, fuck, fuck, fuck. I'm getting smaller. You're not getting smaller. You're just a strength athlete now for the time being. And you'll know that that's a thing because one half of a week when you've managed to train every single major muscle group once in the first half week after you meet, you're like, holy shit, I'm the biggest and leanest and most pumped I've ever been. Well, motherfucker, you didn't regain all your muscle in half a fucking week. It's going to take a few weeks. So it looks like you didn't lose any muscle at all. So a lot of times people think they, think they need a lot of uh, sort of adjunct hypertrophy volume to keep their size and they don't. Uh, conventional strength training is really, really good at keeping size. It doesn't look like it, but the size is all there. What would be your recommendation on um, how long the hypertrophy phase should last, assuming that X person doesn't have a nationals and a world's, you know, yeah, yeah, six yeah. months right about, they can choose whenever their meets sure, are going to go, Sure, but their goal is to build, you know, maximal strength Yeah, where sometimes I'll have people tell me I'm on my four week hypertrophy phase and I kind of roll my eyes. Yeah. Like, yeah like it's how quite much, a small time. How much muscle you yeah. really think? You'll gain some, but not much. And, and and another problem with that is like, if after four weeks, you just return to your work capacity that now empowers you to gain real size and um, even more size that is, and then you're gone. It's like tuning your fucking car for three hours, taking it one lap around the track and be like, that's it. Like, really? Three hours of tuning for that? Can't you stay the rest of the day and do a mm. couple more laps? So I would say that 12 to 16 weeks of hypertrophy training is a good conversation starter for a serious meat and potatoes hypertrophy phase. In some cases, you can do fucking five or six months of hypertrophy training two months of strength training to get your groove back and then five or six months more. Because some people are like, I'm moving from the 198s to the 242s. And you're like, yes, that's not going to take you like four weeks. I'll tell you that. So four weeks is okay. Eight weeks is better. 12 weeks is dope. 16, if you can survive it, is really awesome. And you have the time without having to go back to strength mm -hmm. and peaking. After 16 weeks of hypertrophy training, a lot of people get a lot of stainless, you know, uh, and the size gains aren't coming as easy. Um, they've also spent so much time outside of their – core lifts that they're they're going to feel like fucking Bambi walking for the first time when they do low bar squats again. Um, but yeah, 12 to 16 weeks, I would say like that has a serious attempt at putting on some real fucking slabs of beef. And the thing is, you will be detrained from strength training. You're going to freak out because you're going to be weaker after that. I remember writing a guy, a free program. So it was back when I was in grad school, I just wrote free programs for almost everyone because I was 
trying uh, mm-hmm. to learn. And I wrote this guy a program. It was a hypertrophy program, phase one of three, to give him a bigger bench. And after phase one, he didn't contact me. And I saw him like a little bit later and I was like, dude, what's up? And he's like, yeah, man, it just made me weaker. And I was like, what do you mean? So I maxed out my bench and I was weaker. And I was like, oh my God, I want to disappear from the face of this earth. It's supposed to make you weaker, motherfucker, but you're jacked. It's going to take a few weeks to make you as strong as you were before. And it's going to take a few more weeks to make you stronger than you've ever been. And then a few weeks later, you'll really milk out all the new size gains or all the strength from that new size. And you're going to be strong in a way that you can't even relate to. That's how hypertrophy phase works. It's a delayed effect. The number one, not number one, one of the number one reasons that periodization is a hard sell is because it Im- implies delayed effect. We take a delayed effect for granted in many other parts of our lives. Um, if anyone goes to their freshman year of college expecting to make $90,000 a, a year, the year after, they're fucking insane. Actually, college will cost you roughly $90,000 total for the four years that you go. But then the year after, you'll have an okay job to make some money. It's five years later when you're driving a Benz or whatever, the people are like, man, that guy probably went to college, shit like that. Mm-hmm. You're willing to chunk like nine years out of your life to start really making the gains. Like my wife is um, – um, she did her fellowship in sports medicine, which means she did undergrad. She did a two-year post back program. She did three years of medical school, th- two or three years, three years of residency, and then one year of fellowship. What the fuck? She's not a full bore super practicing doctor until fucking goddamn 12 years of her fucking career. What the fuck? Mm-hmm. That's one hell of a sink. But you got guys out there not willing to put in like six months of you won't be your strongest ever in these six months in order to just completely annihilate all of their PRs a mere two months after that six month period. And then two months later, they're fucking winning worlds. But nah, fuck that. I just want to like always be strong. And if you always want to be strong, I love it. It's dope. But you're missing something. And in most of the countries, that are really good at weightlifting and all these other sports. They do modern periodization. There's actually a term for it. And some of them work not in month cycles, not in yearly cycles, not annual cycles, quadrennial cycles. Mm-hmm. Like you'll see a guy lifting at the world championships and weightlifting on a like a three years before an Olympic year. And you're like, his final attempt in the fucking clean and jerk looked like a walk in the park. That's on purpose, you dumb asshole. The fuck does he care that he breaks the world record for the 17th time in a row? He's trying to make sure that that weird little elbow, uh, I was going to use a British term that would get me canceled here. It sounds a lot like the bad word for uh, uh, a certain ethnic minority in the United States. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to, uh, British people laugh in the comments. A little, little elbow weirdness that he's got. He talked to his coach about it the week before world championships. He's like, just take your fucking easy attempts. You'll win no problem. Because world championships are dope and you've, until you've won like three of them. And then you've never won the Olympics though. And you tell people you're, you're flying somewhere and they're like, oh, you're a weightlifter. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, like Olympics? Like, yeah, yeah. Do you ever win the Olympics? You're like, well, I won the world championships a bunch and it fucking stings and it'll sting the rest of your goddamn life. So what you're going to do is you're going to lay low and you're going to plot and you're going to plan. You're going to get healthy. You're going to build size. You're going to build core strength. And then your absolute best peak will occur at the Olympics. And if you do it right, you're going to win. And then blow jobs forever for you. Mm -hmm. So that kind of long-term thinking and strength athletics is a characteristic of many of the countries that do it best. Um, The other thing is, and this is really dark side, but a lot of the best countries at strength sports are people like Eastern Bloc communist countries. The reason they can plan really well for their athletes is because they don't care about their athletes. They don't care about their athletes' ego. They don't give a fuck if you feel strong today. Fuck you. You're a property of the state. Terrible. Awful. That's why the fuck my parents ran away and took my sister and I with them. But they can think long term. This is all they care about. Kim Jong only cares about gold medals. He doesn't give a fuck about what you feel like at the gym. But you look at athletes in the free world, American athletes, it matters to them that they feel good and strong. Some of them on a more regular basis than others. Now, most of them have amazing coaches and they all do modern periodization now. It's not a big deal. But you get this thing with Americans and a lot with American powerlifters where like, YOLO, motherfucker, I got to be strong today. I got to be strong tomorrow. And there's a place for being strong at the gym and that's dope. Um, but uh, it's not always. And if you're a real serious motherfucker, you're, you're plotting to be the best you can be. Sometimes you got to do things now that don't make you the best now. An analogy from bodybuilding is really straightforward. When you're in a fucking off season bodybuilding, People are like, damn, dude, like you're kind of thick. You're like, yeah. Like, but you compete. You want to be really lean, right? Yeah. And these people don't know anything about mm-hmm. the sport. And they're like, well, so, so why are you this big? 
You're like, well, you see, if I don't get this big, I'll never add any size. And then I'll be just as lean as I always am, but I'll be the same weight every fucking year or up by a couple pounds. But for me to put on 20 or 30 pounds during my career, I got to bulk up. Nobody fucking does. Who the fuck likes peak massing in bodybuilding? Name one pro bodybuilder to me, DM in the comments or whatever, uh, that likes weighing 300 fucking pounds. I had an opportunity to talk to Re uh, Regan Grimes, who's like one of the best bodybuilders. And I think he was like at 300 or 305 at the time. And I talked to him and I, just, I literally just met him like a second ago. And I was like, he's just like standing like this. And I was like, how do you feel? He's like, man. <laughs> and I was like, how are you sleeping? He's like, dude, just got my CPAP evaluation. And like, basically I was just mostly not breathing all the time. And they got a CPAP at work. Great. But like, I guarantee you, Regan Grimes does not love. I can't, can't guarantee that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We can ask. Yeah. I guess he's, he's not in love with weighing 320 fucking pounds. Nobody fucking likes that. You can't fucking sleep. You can't move. You can't breathe. Fuck that. But he's doing it for a purpose because when he steps on the Olympia stage, he wants to step a 280 instead of 255 because at 280, he wins the whole goddamn thing. 255, you know, whatever, top 10, whatever. Which when you get to that level, Top 10 in the Olympia is dope, but almost everyone who gets the top 10, they want their number one spot. Mm -hmm. And for the number one spot, they're willing to crush a whole year of them not even looking like shit, who, looking like who gives a fuck to make that ultimate happen. But you got some guys who just want to be lean and on trend all year long. Dope, amazing, but they just don't get really good over the long term because they're not willing to take one step back to take two steps forward. That is the quintessential, one of the quintessential concepts of periodization is strategy. Like if you're an army general and your your idea of combat is advance on all fronts all the time, you're not an army general for long. Yeah. If your idea is advance, we're tired, strengthen the lines, retreat, regroup, move again, something's going to happen. Well, the, this is an interesting topic to me and it's one of the hardest things to sell when I'm speaking. Oh my God. <laughs> How and do you sell I, that? <laughs> well, the way that I do that is I'll say things such as you've already committed to long-term things before mm -hmm. you started high school, then you finished high school. That yes. was roughly three or They're four They're like, years. I actually didn't. You're like, Ooh, yeah. wrong crowd. Yeah. Or, you know, college the same way. <laughs> sure. Or I can flip back and say, remember when we went into the pandemic and everything locked down, that mm -hmm. was like four years ago. Mm -hmm. Then like, that seems like yesterday. Right. It really did. Well, yeah. So mm -hmm. they can think back and it's a blip. Yep. But they can't think forward and with that same blip type of concept. That's, a, that's some why shit, dude. So, you you know, I flip I've never that back that on way. them. Yeah. And then it's like, well, four years from now, you're going to think of this discussion yes. like it just happened yesterday. Yes. And it didn't. Yeah. And you're going to say, thank God I did that shit. Yeah. Like when you're standing on the Olympic fucking podium and you've got the gold medal wrapped around, all that shit's going to be fucking worth it. And if you're a gym hero and you take like off podium in the Olympics, Nobody gives a fuck that you fucking rack 250 in the in fucking open gym a couple of days before or a couple of years before the Olympics. Nobody cares. Mm -hmm. Weightlifters care. I'm like, dude, that's the guy that really should be winning. And people are like, why didn't he win? Like, I don't know. I just couldn't peak at the right time. What a fucking tragedy. What a tragedy. So you want to avoid a personal tragedy? You're going to be like, uh, do you remember the movie 300 with Gerard yeah. Butler and shit? It was like uh, he was talking about the the little fucking ritual where they kick the six year olds out to live by themselves or whatever, mm -hmm. and he was talking about like hunting and killing that fucking mega wolf. And I, I remember like it got really like not scary scary. I was like twenty something when I saw it. it wasn't scary, but I was like it was intense when he was describing the wolf. And he's like one of the things he said it was he's hungry and he's patient. Like if a predator is patient, you're in real deep shit, real deep shit. Impatience is something you hope a predator does so he fucks up and you can mm -hmm. tag him with your spear. But if he's patient, it's going to be real tough. Do you want to be the person that's like a rabid chihuahua? Ah, I want to do this now. I want the, the big dumbbells now. Or do you want to be the lion? Stalking, patient, curious, confident, knowing that it's going to be worth the investment. Eh, I don't know. Chihuahuas are dope. I would much rather own a chihuahua than a lion. Eh, mm -hmm. I don't know about that. Chihuahuas are such... Do you know they have the one of the highest um, bite rates of all dogs? I did not know that. Yeah. Chihuahuas, uh, ruthless fucking animals, Dave. And they, and, they, and they kill millions of Americans per year. I'm kidding. That last part's a joke. <laughs> wait, now, wait a minute. But they haven't killed yeah, anyone. That's yeah, impossible. Yeah. <laughs> you made a post on your Instagram months ago. I can't remember what it was now, but I messaged you about it and said, I'm going to ask you about this uh -oh. because a lot of the comments were stay in your lane. Yeah, yeah. And when I'm reading those and I'm asking myself, first off, I, whatever you posted, there was no context to it. You just posted sure. whatever it was, sure. like thoughts or whatever it sure. was. And I'm, I'm asking myself, like, what exactly does, what does that mean? Like, stay in your lane. Like, when you break down the words of what that's, what is that supposed to mean? Yes. It was, like, we need to talk about this yeah. one, right? Because yeah. 
if that means, you know, for myself that my lane is, you know, strength and conditioning or powerlifting, mm -hmm. whatever it is, mm -hmm. then I'm not allowed to vote in my local election yeah. because that's not my but, lane. But Dave, you got to be careful. We can we can stretch this really to the extremes. <laughs> you just said, and, and I mean all of this is a, a, obviously for, for comedic purposes, yeah. I illustrate a ridiculous point that I don't believe. But Dave, to be honest, your lane isn't strength and conditioning. You don't have any advanced degrees in it. You've mm -hmm. never coached a national team. Who the fuck are you? Just some guy that fucking like know Louis Simmons and built a fucking big ass company. And mm -hmm. You're just a fucking millionaire. And you're not a fucking expert. Fuck you. How many degrees you got? I got mm -hmm. a bunch. What do you have? Nothing. You're not even in the, you're not, you don't have a fucking lane. You're just some white dude from Ohio. Mm -hmm. If we stretch that out, nobody's got a fucking lane except Elon Musk and Albert Einstein, mm -hmm. maybe. Uh, and so that stay in your lane thing, uh, we can even stretch it that far to be that absurd, mm -hmm. 100%. But let's let's do the, the thing I'm uh, trying to do more. You know, every time I'm on like plenty of gear, I turn into a meaner version of myself and I hate it. So I'm trying to like be conscious of that. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll try to be very uh, charitable. <laughs> and uh, But don't worry, I'll get to the mean jokey stuff in a bit. Yeah, okay. Uh, there is a way we can steal man that position. When people who have absolutely no fucking clue what they're talking about pop off at the mouth about all kinds of shit, it's frankly embarrassing. And if you have a big platform and you're saying completely ridiculous shit, there is some kind of argument to make that like, you're literally just spreading misinformation. You are not helping. Maybe you're hurting. Maybe you're hurting. And also, when people say stay in your lane, they're absolutely exercising their God-given right for free speech. Mm -hmm. And by God, I mean the service members that make sure that terrorists don't kill us all. And because everyone has an entitled right to free speech in the United States and all the modern countries, people are allowed to tell you to stay in your lane. So it's not like, oh, how dare you? It's like, dope. I love your opinion. I totally respect that you have one. I don't think it's accurate, or but 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 there is a point to it. There's mm -hmm. totally a point. Like, imagine like um, here's an example. Imagine some like doctor who's never lifted a weight in his life posts and it's, let's say he has a million followers on Instagram. He posts like weightlifting is dangerous. Never do deadlifts. They're bad for your back. What the fuck would you say about that? You'd be like, Ex exactly. What is your expertise for that? Like, I'm a doctor. But like, oh, an orthopedic surgeon. Like, no, actually, a gastroenterologist. You'd be like, <gasps> stay in your lane. Mm -hmm. So I get it. So on the one hand, it's totally understandable what they're saying. But on the other hand, I can think of one snarky thing that's funny and makes some kind of a point and one actual intellectual thing. Which one do you want first? The snarky thing. The snarky thing. Again, all good vibes. <laughs> just joking. All right? good. The people that say stay in your lane are nine times out of 10 irrelevant, involuntary celibates who have no friends and no profile picture and they don't have any followers and they're barely fucking human. And I don't know, they might just be Russian or Chinese bots for all I can tell because they spend most of their time saying mean things to people on the internet and no one cares about them at all and they probably know it. And to put a fine point on the snark, what the fuck is your lane, motherfucker? Are you expert at anything? Is your lane the – did you get a master's degree in the technical critique of other people's posts? <laughs> You're not, you don't have a lane. And your lane sure as shit is not talking shit to me, pussy. That's the snark. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't really mean that. Mm -hmm. But also, it hits. Mm -hmm. The other retort is, look, we all say some dumb shit sometimes. And even if you're really smart and really qualified, you can still say dumb wrong shit. And lots of people that have no technical training in a subject are just fucking wise and they say right shit all the goddamn time. I'm going to bring up Menno Henselman's again. Menno has absolutely zero degrees in anything physiological or biological or anything related to fitness. I believe he has a degree in business from some like university in the fucking Netherlands. Dude, unless he's talking about Dutch business practices, I stay in your lane, Menno. But Menno also happens to be a literal genius and is so insightful and well-read and so attentive that I would consider him one of the top five fitness experts in the world writ large, period, end of conversation. But he doesn't have a lane. But it's not Menno Henselman's PhD. I didn't see him in any degree programs I went to. So you can just be a person who's just a human being and you can say true things no matter who you are. And to say that you have to be somebody to say true things is the commission of what's called the genetic fallacy. The idea that an idea that was generated by someone, it, we can judge that idea based on who generated it. No, ideas are judged on only their merits. 
if the worst dictator in the world said, look, the right to bear arms is essential and freedom and liberty for all is awesome. Are you going to be like, nope, Kim, him, Kim Jong-un said it. I hate him. He's wrong. Like, nope, he just happens to be right. I don't like that he's right. I hope he dies yesterday, but he just happens to be correct. So at the end of the day, the best way, I think, to judge people's comments and people's exposés and whatever the fuck they want to talk about is like on the merits of what they want to say. So when people say stay in your lane, in many cases, uh, that is an accurate reflection of their belief that I shouldn't be saying things I'm not credentialed in and I totally respect that. And there's some fucking validity there. But a lot of times the reason they say that is because they just have a lot of feelings and not a lot of thoughts. Whatever it is I said hurt their heartstrings somehow. And because they're triggered by it and they're just feeling a lot, they want to say something mean. And there's nothing more mean in most people's minds than to to put you into a diminutive position, to put you beneath, to put you in, uh, out of the contest, out of the contestant area of people that should be qualified to speak on something. Stay in your lane doesn't mean stay in your lane. They don't care that I stay in my lane. If I'm like, hey guys, I'm not going to stay in my lane. I'm going to stop publishing and speaking and doing YouTube. I'm never going to talk about exercise again. They're going to be like, no, I said stay in your lane. They'd be like, great, shut up, fuck you, die. They want you to stay out of the lane of whatever it is that triggered the living fuck out of them because they have a lot of feelings about it. Now, if they had a lot of thoughts about it, they might not be inclined to say stay in your lane. They might say, hey man, I, I like that you said this, but I can figure out at least three things that's wrong with your point. Now, that requires talking and thinking, and you want to have a decent conversation about some shit, and I happen to be checking my comment sections, which I check less and less because mostly it's the people that are completely insane in them. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to have that out, man. If I have some free time, I'd love to have a respectful, logical conversation. And if I'm wrong, I'll 100% admit it. I used, to, I used to debate professional economists for fun in various forums, and half the time, they fucked me up. Half the other time, I showed up. I did really well. Uh, when I got fucked up, I was like, that does not feel good to lose a debate. Clearly, you you know you're losing. Yeah. You're like, well, fuck you. You have a small dick and you log mm -hmm. off. And you're like, oh, God, he got me. But you learn shit from it. So it's really good for you. And then you won't make that same mistake again. So when someone levels a critique of you, against you later, you're like, ooh, I actually used to say that and that's not true. And then you tell them the shit the economist told you and they're like, oh, God damn, you got me. I didn't know mm -hmm. why I said it. So at the end of the day, everyone can have an opinion and be either correct or incorrect about a variety of things. There were a lot of people during the COVID times that were like damn near illiterate, non-high school graduates that made better, more cogent logical sense than licensed medical doctors and the other way around. Truth doesn't care about who the fuck you are. So stay in your lane is dope and I feel that energy. But on the other hand, like let's all get in the same lane and just discuss ideas without resorting to insults. Mm -hmm. And insults are funny. They're funny, but they don't really help move us forward much. And like Again, funny, snarky thing I don't really mean. Like you try to make fun of me on Instagram, there is a chance you're going you're gonna to fucking zap me better than I can zap you, but it's not likely because I'm fast <laughs> and I'm witty and I don't have – and, you know, and I have a small shriveled up dick and I, I, I cry alone at night every night, but I'm good at a few things and I can probably make fun of you better than you can make fun of me. You want a shot at the title? Let's go. <laughs> I'm not going to give you the shot because making fun of people is a quality use of your time when you're 13 years old. And when you go to high school, you realize, oh, shit, I can actually learn things and have real discussions with people. So stay in your lane, not a part of a real discussion. And an, uh, if I was my more Buddhist self at those moments, when people say, dude, shut up, stay in your lane, the way I would respond if I wanted to engage was, hey, listen, I hear you, man. I could be totally fucking wrong about all this. Can you let me know like, what is it that I said? Is like you think in your estimate not correct? And can you let me know like maybe an alternate idea I could believe that makes more sense to you? A lot of the times you tell that to people and they, they turn real nice and then you have a beautiful conversation. And usually, unfortunately, which is why I don't engage most people in the comment section anymore, there a lot of people like trolls, they're like do hit and runs. Well, they, they're commenting on everyone's page. That's all they do all day long. Mm -hmm. And they don't even check their replies. So when you say, hey, man, I'd love to have a conversation about this, you just never see them again. And I check my shit two days later and they're not there. A week later, they're not there. And I just abandoned it. I've done. I've been done dirty like that so many times that like when a guy's like, dude, you're a fucking idiot. Stay in your lane. I'm like, nah, all right. That guy just has a lot of feelings. <laughs> Were there any topics that you wanted to discuss I didn't bring up? Um... I cut a couple jokes in my brain and I was like, that one will get us canceled. So no. Um, 
No, I think I, I mean, it's been one hell of a fucking episode here, man. Mm-hmm. Hold breath. I, 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 I really truly enjoy having conversations with you, man. Like all, all the fucking podcasting aside, it's fucking awesome. No. And, uh, look, if this doesn't get you canceled and if this episode does any kind of numbers, I'd give me another six months to a year and I'd love to come yeah. back. No, I'd love to have you come out and just hit the strength side. <laughs> sure. You oh, know, I'd love that. Been oh my God. I would love that. I yeah. would love that. Um, the strength side is a huge, huge passion for me. I love talking about it and I have a lot of periodization stuff and insight. Another side I can hit maybe when we talk again is um how to do strength and conditioning for real sport athletes and i'm joking yeah. strength athletes, no, are real I, athletes yeah, but like yeah. volleyball players basketball players hockey players tons of people that follow you way more people that follow you than yeah. follow me are into like they're all strength and conditioning coaches and they're like yeah okay powerlifting's dope but like how do i get my fucking cheerleaders to stop getting hurt and to be able to jump higher and hit their stunts i have that's most of my education and a crap load of my in my experience and just so nobody asked me about it anymore because yeah. no, well, i'll, get big I'll biceps? put that one over the strength one because because that one's super intriguing to me. Me too. Because when you go to lay out blocks for that and you got seasons and shit. Oh, yeah. It like gets special, real complicated. Oh my God. Hockey players. Oh I my mean, God. that's nine months of this. Yeah. this or like, baseball where they yeah. play like eight games a week and you're like, yeah. how do we do any of this? No, that yeah. would be awesome. That yeah. would be great. I'd love that. I want to thank you for coming out again. Um, follow his channel. Oh yeah. Sure. Um, any final thoughts and where can people find you? RP Strength on YouTube. Uh, find me there. And we have like a Diet Coach app and uh, Hypertrophy app. It's a cool app uh, for you to get lean and jacked and a cool app for you to be able to basically just does all of your programming for you. So it's cool if you want to get jacked and stuff like that. It's awesome. And uh, if you want to go watch our YouTube channel, it's super educational. We had a lot of fun. But um, don't turn it on around your children because <laughs> one of my it's lanes is saying obnoxious. Bad. I don't know, man. But you've been around some fucked up yeah, people. Yeah, that's, so. that's what you, got, you make a good point. <laughs> and not that bad. Quote, yeah. guy that trained at Westside for <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know. I get it. I get it. (laughs) But dude, thank you so much for having me, man. It's always a pleasure and an honor. All right. Thank you. And thank you guys for listening. We're done. Why should anyone join this Discord? Why wouldn't you want to? It's not fake. It's genuine. It's authentic. It's well worth it. The Discord has been nothing short of meeting new people who are incredibly like-minded, giving each other a bunch of ball busting, but also being there to support each other in whatever life throws their way. The best part of it for me has also been able to connect with lifters of all levels, help coach, get coached, and also connect with other new fathers who are enjoying the journey of lifting and trying to balance that out. It's the glue that holds all of us together. A common interest will bring people from different walks of life people who are multi-millionaires, these characters and everything else in between, united under one thing, the pursuit of strength. I think most of us would agree that getting a coach is a great step forward that an athlete can make to make greater progress. What if you had two coaches? What if you had a whole bunch of coaches and a whole bunch of driven elite level athletes and like-minded people all in your corner trying to make you better? That's exactly what you're gonna get with the Table Talk Discord crew. There is no avoiding hard training if you want to grow. But if you want to grow the most, your training needs to be hard and smart. RP Hypertrophy app will make sure you're progressing on track, monitoring and adjusting your workout at all times. So for all that work you're doing, you can be sure you're getting the best results. How do you shake yours? Element is a staple for all the elite FTS athletes. What makes it a level up from other electrolytes is its special formula, not only with sodium, but potassium and magnesium too. But what do they do? Sodium maintains fluid balance, blood flow, and boosts nerve impulse firing efficiency. Potassium works with the sodium to help regulate blood pressure and fluid balance. Magnesium supports muscle function, mood, and bone health. It helps all of us at Elite FTS push ourselves harder in training. I know I personally no longer get muscle cramps in my training sessions. America Health is a premium telehealth platform specializing in hormone optimization and preventative medicine. Are you looking to optimize your health in and out of the gym, improve recovery, sex drive, and quality of life? Have you tried speaking to your health professional about this and have gotten the cold shoulder, stereotyped, or just told as part of getting older? Just go to AmericHealth.com backslash table talk 
and you can create your own lab or you can take labs that we've had set up for them which are based upon the same labs that I've been doing over the last 15 years. Or you can use their guided optimization. With this, they'll put you in touch with a patient care coordinator, which is actually pretty cool because you get to sit down and speak to somebody that can understand what you're looking for from hormone optimization and the preventative and medicine standpoint. After that conversation, they'll determine which labs that you should and which tests you should have done. And then from there, get the labs done. They'll review those labs with you and put you in touch with one of their hormone optimization specialists that can determine which supplementation that you should use over the counter or prescription. AmericHealth.com backslash Table Talk. The discount code is Table Talk.